Okay, hello and welcome my gentle and of course very modern aides. This is a bit of an impromptu stream that was inspired by some events from last evening where myself, Dapper Dino, and friend of the channel Maddie of Science Side Up found ourselves discussing the heat problem with an old earth creationist and we realized maybe it's time to sit down and formalize the problem in such a way that if someone out there, whoever they may be in the ether of the internet, decides that they want to tackle the heat problem and the radiation problem, because they do go hand in hand, perhaps a young earth creationist, that they can do so with the with the questions and challenges readily available and, um, and digestible. So they know exactly what they're up against. So you guys know me, I'm Erica, that's a given, this is my channel. And uh, let's let the rest of the panel introduce themselves. We'll start with Dapper. Dapper, tell us who you are and uh, and how you're doing. I'm Dapper Dino, one of apparently like three or four that are out there. I'm the one who does mostly uh, creationist debunking and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, I was also on that stream uh, last night. And uh, really, like Erica said, this is a favor to young earth creationists. If you want to know what to refute, this is going to be a nice resource, not an exhaustive resource, but like you can come here and get, at least get your, your grounding in. Okay, what are the claims that need to be dealt with? We're going to help you with that. Bingo. TD, tell us about yourself. Uh, uh, I, I exist. I, I am here. I, I like rocks. That, that is all. All right, Jordan, tell us who you are. Uh, my name's Jordan. I'm a mechanical and nuclear engineer, so radiation's kind of my thing. Mm -hmm. And I run a podcast called Reason to Doubt with my buddy Jared on skepticism. Awesome. And Jonathan, tell us. I'm a geochemist, and I'm just here to learn. And maybe give, <laughs> maybe give a perspective on, uh, you know, what the geological context of this whole debacle is. That'll be fun. Yeah, I think that's a good idea because in the end, that's that's what we're all here to do, right? We're all here to learn from one another. This certainly isn't my area of expertise. When I first made a video about the heat problem with regard to the hydroplate hypothesis about a year ago, it took so much backtracking into like the depths of my undergrad career to re-remember how, how does physics work? <laughs> how does all of this really hash out? How does it stack up? Uh, which is why I'm very grateful to have the panel that we have here today, because everybody's got everybody's got something to to really give information wise, and we all are we're all here familiar with this particular issue. Um, so, for those of you who in the who are here in the chat and might be wondering, like, what is uh, the heat problem? What is the radiation problem? Why are we sitting here talking about it? Uh, that's what I'm going to do now, real quick. This I got to share my screen. I got a little uh, bogus PowerPoint for you. So you can appreciate kind of what we're talking about as they get into um into the meat of it. So can you guys see this? Yes, I can. Cool. Okay, so the heat and radiation problems. We're here to talk about it because we all run science channels or do science stuff, which means we're not huge fans of, of young earth creationism due to its kind of pseudoscientific bent. And so the heat and radiation problems make for very simple concepts that preclude which it's very important to distinguish between evidence against something versus evidence that precludes it, uh, young earth creationism. So what are the heat and radiation problems? Well, young earth creationists, of course, suppose that the earth is 6,000 years old and that there was a big global flood that's responsible for pretty much the state of everything. That's like the geologic column, the, the radioisotopes that we have, um, the position in the continents, etc. So they have to cram Conventional science is 4.5 billion years of various physical and geological processes into the single year of the flood to explain why the Earth looks like it's old. So these processes include, like I've said, radioactive decay states, impact craters. So every single time an asteroid hits the surface of the Earth and releases a lot of heat, that's all got to happen in that single year of the flood because did they occur throughout the geologic column, which they, of course, suppose happened during the year of the flood. Current position of the tectonic plates, etc. So all these processes release heat. They got to cram it into a single year, and that results in lethal heat and radiation, hence the heat and radiation problems. You can't cram all of that into such a small time period without there being serious consequences. So how much heat, you might be asking? It depends on the model. CPT, or catastrophic plate tectonics, is the model that's held by the classic YEC organizations. Your Answers in Genesis, your Institute for Creation Research, your Creation Ministries International. And... Uh, 
This is problematic because it results in enough heat to vaporize the granitic crust of the Earth several times over. Now, that's not a straw man. That's the math put out by the younger creationists themselves, as you'll see in the next slide. Uh, and this model typically includes the heat from the friction of the continents, hence the name catastrophic plate tectonics, because they're explaining why all these continents went from their previous organizations to the present one, uh, as well as accounting for things like accelerated nuclear decay to explain why radiometric dating says the Earth looks old and all impact events. Hydroplate is the other main model, quote unquote, and it's held by more fringe young Earth creationists. It was thought up by, uh, by local genius Walt Brown. And <laughs> results in the heat equivalent of 5,000 trillion one megaton hydrogen bombs, which is the math, again, gleaned from the creator, Walt Brown. That's 2.2 times 10 raised 38 ergs of energy. It's a lot. So it includes heat from all of the above, same stuff as catastrophic plate tectonics. But the reason it's so much worse is because it also has to eject all of this Earth material up into space to account for the impact events, because Walt Brown supposes that all the cratering we have here on Earth is from Earth ejecta being thrown up during the flood, from the fountains of the great deep bursting open and then falling back down and peppering the surface of the earth as if it's like the, the, the you know pimpled face of a teenager and let's not forget also peppering the entire rest of the solar system and resulting in every single primarily watery body like in terms of uh comets right so yep. we're going to get into that later as to what kind of energy you need to get the comets into position here and when i vastly underestimate it it's still going to be a rather ridiculous number. Right. So we'll we'll be very clear when we're going through this entire like panel chat hangout, uh, whether or not we're talking about CPT or hydroplate. You can generally assume that if it applies to CPT, it also applies to hydroplate. It's just hydroplate also has a lot crazier stuff involved with it as well. Um, Here's a really great slide from 2018 by William Worker. He was one of the big YECs that's basically come out and been like, hi, we have a heat problem. We need to fix it. And they, of course, have not fixed it quite yet. I don't think that they ever will. I don't imagine many members of this panel do either. Um, and they don't think that they will either unless they invoke exotic solutions. So this is from uh, Heat Problems Associated with the Genesis Flood Models, Part 1. And uh, you can read this down here. Uh, it says the authors report that faced with the evidence, a young earth advocate must address at least two key scientific problems resulting from a one year period of accelerated decay rates during the flood. The first is the heat problem. And then, of course, the second is going to be the radiation problem. And they talk about how we don't have a solution to this yet. It says, nevertheless, the rate group is confident the issues will be solved. Um, they're not solved quite yet. This is a picture from the Creation Museum talking about what kind of catastrophic plate tectonics we're working with, because it's bad enough that you have to go from Pangaea to the current position of the continents in one year. The continents are moving around at like go-kart speeds at that point, but they actually need them to go from Rodinia to Pangaea to present. That's race car speeds. Look that, I just race car sped off the picture right off well, the current position. Well, well so you're only looking at like sub meter a second, well, like, oh no, 30 centimeters a second, 40 centimeters a second uh, in order to get that. My level of movement, so like, hey, it's not, it's, not, it's not that fast. Come on, not why. they zoom in though. So then, this is from Walt Brown's uh, uh website, so that you know that I'm I'm really not exaggerating when I say it's 2.2 times 10 raised 38 ergs. That's the number he gives. So, professionally educated creationists know that this is a problem that can't be solved by miracles. All of us here on the panel have said this before, but this has been not appreciated by very many of the creationists that are here online because no one who has like a professional education in, in anything even tangential to geology or physics in the creationism world thinks that this is an issue that is readily um that is readily solved Baumgartner says in addition to another question i do believe in order to cool the 60 70 80 100 kilometer thick ocean lithosphere that in a catastrophic plate tectonic scenario had to be generated at a mid mid ocean ridge during the flood in order to get rid of all that heat in that thick layer thermal conductivity could not do it even hydrothermal circulation would only cool the uppermost part of it. I believe it had to involve God's intervention to cool that rock down. This is reiterated by Humphreys, who says using two processes, accelerated radioactive decay and cooling, God could adjust temperatures in the rocks to whatever he wanted. Temperatures both rising and falling during both periods, the antediluvian age and the year of the flood. And then, of course, there is the classic. Those of you who, uh, who are even remotely familiar with creationism know about the Rate Project. This was a crack team of young earth creationists, geologists, physicists, et cetera. 
And they all got together about two decades ago and they were like, we're going to show that accelerated nuclear decay can happen. That way we can explain why anytime anybody radiometrically dates anything, it shows that the earth is older than 6,000 years. But at the end of, the, of their, their project in 2005, they actually had to admit that a young earth position cannot be reconciled with the scientific data without assuming, assuming exotic solutions will be discovered in the future. No known thermodynamic process could account for the required rate of heat removal, nor is there any known way to protect organisms from radiation damage. So this has been like accepted by a great many creationists, all of the professional ones that I could at least find recognize there's an issue, but they are trying to solve it, but at least they recognize there's an issue at present. So this is just a going to, to be added to during the course of this, this chat on the panel. What are the major challenges for young earth creationists specifically? So put simply, assuming that mineralization can even occur, because again, we're dealing with vast, vast, vast amounts of heat here. They have to mitigate all the heat and radiation. So some of the proposed solutions that don't work that I'm assuming we're going to get into are like hypercane, space is a heat sink, directed heat, the piezoelectric effect, Z-pinch, space expansion, and, and more. So does anybody else want to add anything uh, about, the, about the heat problem? Uh, there is this? there's one quick thing, which is when you said that anyone with any training in geology acknowledges that this is, you know, a really big problem, that includes and especially means the creationist geologists and physicists involved, because remember, all of them who've actually looked into this have noted there's a, there's a heat problem. However, we do occasionally find sort of um, amateur YouTube lights in the creationist ecosystem there, pretending that there just isn't a heat problem. Like, ah, there's no heat problem. It's like, no, no, there's a heat problem. There's a really, really big heat problem, guys. And uh, your professionals, the guys that you think are in charge of science agree. Um, yeah, I mean, they've, they've proposed quote unquote solutions, um, such as, let, let me look at my notes here, um, that the radiation and heat was just absorbed by the floodwaters. They were the heat sink, yeah. It's, I'm sure that's going to work well for oceanic life when the oceans are boiling. Or plasma. If you want, I can um, add some numbers to the radiation side. I haven't done any calculations on the geology side because that's not my area of expertise, but um, the th this is actually underestimating it, but um, one very quick and dirty way you can come up with a number is if you're going to accelerate the decay such that you have however many billions of years worth of decay happening within a year, then um, you don't need to really mess with the, the decay rates and everything. You can just say, okay, well, 2 billion years worth of heat happens here. Uh, so you can say, okay, well, how much heat is something giving away now per year? And then multiply that by 2 billion. That's vastly underestimating it because in fact, um, two, 2 billion years ago, there was more of it because it's been decaying for 2 billion years. You know, So if you take the amount down here at the bottom of the curve and multiply by 2 billion, that's an underestimation, but fine. It doesn't matter. It, it's still plenty to, to destroy the earth. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, for example, if you look at the uh, uranium and thorium in the Earth's crust, right now it gives out about 23.9 terawatts of heat. Uh, so that's 7.54 times 10 to the 20th joules. Uh, it's a lot of joules, but that's over the whole surface of the Earth. That's right now. Uh, so you take that, multiply it by 2 billion. That's 1.5 times 10 to the 30th joules. That's roughly equivalent to one hour's out energy output from the sun. Um, so that's how much heat they have to get rid of. Uh, and if you say, yeah, uh, that, that's a lot of heat. So a lot of heat. it's getting hot. Right. And, and to put it into, into temperatures, because the, the number of joules and stuff, and like when you get scientific notation, it can be kind of hard to kind of really visualize what's happening. So uh, we can just say, okay, well, if everything's sped up by that amount, uh, we'll look at granite. And um, granite puts out heat based on the radioactive decay of the uranium and stuff in it right now. The amount it puts out is about 10 to the ninth, 10 to the negative ninth uh, watts per kilogram, um, and it has a specific heat of about 790 joules per kilogram Kelvin. So you dial that up to two billion, uh, yeah. plug in the numbers and the temperature, and and this is violates some assumptions of the formula, but it uh, the temperature you get is 90,000 Kelvin. Now, in fact, the mm -hmm. granite would vaporize long before that happened. Yeah. You right. know, so right. so like. That it would break down, but the point is, you have sufficient heat there to 
and if anyone doesn't know what 90,000 Kelvin is, the sun, the surface of the sun is about 6,000 Kelvin. Yeah, it's... Yeah. So, like, so it's, it's, it's going to be hot. We're then, a here where even just radiation-wise, the hot, Earth is hot enough to become the dominant source of energy for the solar system, mm -hmm. not the sun. Right. By a significant and, yeah, margin. Too. By a significant right. margin. And then that's just the heat. Then if you're talking about the radiation, if somehow you got rid of that heat, you still got the radiation. Uh, for example, say Noah ate bread while he was in on the ark, you know? Bread the is radioactive. somehow isn't plasma? Right. <laughs> I, I don't know what exotic shielding they've got, but whatever. Somehow they've shielded themselves. I don't know. Uh, bread is radioactive too. And so you can do the same kind of calculations, give it two billion years worth of radiation. Uh, the dosage from eating bread for Noah would have been 48,600 millisieverts per hour. 8,000 millisieverts will kill you. Not like, oh, stochastic, you'll get cancer, but no, you're like DED dead at 8,000. Yeah. And so like every single hour, you're receiving six or more lethal doses of radiation from your bread. <laughs> it, it's, so. it, I, I remember too, you had covered um, it, an anonymous YouTuber of, of the Young Earth Creationist Persuasion had been discussing this. You and David Nev had covered a video that they had done. Um, and in that, there appeared to be a misunderstanding that this related only to bananas, because bananas are obviously the only radioactive food. Would you like to elaborate just a moment on that, just to clear things up? Yeah, so um, in, in my talk with uh, McQueen, I put up a picture of a banana with a radioactive symbol on it, because I thought it was funny. Um, and some people <laughs> inferred that to mean that I was only talking about bananas. Um, bananas are radioactive, but so is everything else. Everything you touch or eat or drink, every single thing you interact with is radioactive to some extent. Right. So, and uh, all of those things are, are they're harmless because, you know, it's just a very low level of radiation. But when you're doing 2 billion years or more of radiation in a very short time, it suddenly is not so harmful. I mean, uh, for example, they mentioned um, that you have, I think it was 130 grams of potassium in your body at any one time, which I, if I, I looked it up, is about right. But you can figure, okay, there's like 0.01% of that is potassium 40. Well, how much would that do? Turns out that the potassium that would have been in Noah's body the minute this accelerated decay kicked off would have boiled his blood. Like, yeah. You can't. Speaking, there's no shielding from that. <laughs> speaking, speaking of um, of solutions that create more problems than they solve, the, the piezoelectric effect is one that's brought up a lot, at least in in modern circles that you know refuse to, to see that there is indeed an issue. And the concept of the piezoelectric effect it comes from what we see with you know very small scale experiments as well as like lightning, right? So this idea that electrons can be stripped and thus accelerated nuclear decay can be triggered by these, these for whatever reason, however they would be triggered, these these vast electric fields that that's, are supposed- That doesn't whatever. work. I was yeah. just saying, elect, so the thing about nuclear decay, right, is it's a nuclear process. Anything that happens to your electrons doesn't matter. And in fact, even if you have your electron stripped and then the positively charged nucleus starts flowing, that still doesn't matter. In order to, in, to cause nuclear reactions, through some means that you're actually causing, you have to get nucleons to interact with your nucleus. That's why in fission reactors, we hit nuclei with neutrons of a specific energy. If all you're doing is having electrical flow involving positively charged nuclei, it's not gonna do a damn thing to decay uh, rates. One caveat to that, it's okay. not completely accurate. Uh, that that is accurate for almost all nuclear reactions. The one that, yeah. that occur include in the nucleus, right? Uh, but there are some nuclear reactions, beta man, beta minus decays, that do involve the electrons. That's uh, true. So uh, you can have electron capture. This is relevant for potassium forty, which is something we use for for uh, dating. Uh, an electron essentially falls into the nu the nucleus, um, turns one of the protons into a neutron, and emits some gamma rays and stuff. Uh, yeah. So if you stripped all of the electrons from a potassium 40 atom, well, it can't capture electrons anymore be because there's none to capture. So it would right. basically become stable. So like you can't and affect this one very specific kind of right. uh, radioactive decay through exotic means, uh, but that wouldn't affect like alpha decay. But you know? yeah, and that's one of the things is we need 
all nuclear decay processes to increase by the same factor over the same time and decreasing a particular kind of decay rate mm -hmm. isn't going to help that at all. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, if you stripped all of the potassium 40, all, all the, the electrons from potassium, that's going to, that, that stops the, the decay. We need to not stop it. We need to, to supercharge it. You know, like that's not helping. Maybe, maybe yeah. you just shove a whole bunch of extra electrons at it somehow. Just, I, but again, in only one decay uh, process that is accelerated, even if you could do that, it doesn't help. Correct me um, if I'm wrong too. Maybe maybe this is completely off base, but in order to do so as well, like the the, the kind of electric field that you're going to have to be invoking to get the the piezoelectric electric effect to the degree that they want it, let's assume everything else works and all you need is the presence of the effect. Yeah, that's going to be a pretty lethal electric field, would it not? I mean, I haven't run numbers, but stripping all of the electrons off of almost anything that's heavier than you know a you know, a few electrons takes a bit of energy. And if you're going as high as like potassium, yeah, that's, it's not easy to just strip all the electrons off. So, so we have a name for that. It's called plasma. Yeah. yeah. When you completely, when, when you heat it to the point where the, the electrons are completely disassociated from their atom, it's a plasma, right? So uh, I, I don't know how much energy that would be, but it would be enough to turn whatever it touched into plasma, which uh, for anyone who's not familiar, it's hotter than gas, and, and liquid, right? The sun is is something you're probably familiar with. It's made of plasma. Yeah, there you go. So it, yeah, that's the kind of levels of energy we're talking about. So, so if I may summarize so far, just for those of you who who might be coming in, we've discussed already how the radiation outside of the heat problem alone, the radiation is going to be a problem because accelerating nuclear decay, which all models of of the young Earth creationist biblical flood require to explain the observations that we see today. That kind of accelerated nuclear decay is going to cause pretty much all the food, actually all the food on, on Noah's Ark and water as well, to <laughs> emit lethal doses of, of radiation several mm -hmm. thousands of times over. Um, the piezoelectric effect isn't going to work as far as using that for your accelerated nuclear decay. One, and the, I'm a little bit iffy on this, so tell me if I'm wrong. One, because stripping the electrons is going to stop the decay. You need more than just some decay. It, it'll stop electron capture decay. So it'll stop your potassium 40 from decaying. Okay, so it's not going to get you for all of your required elements in our geologic column. No, right. uh, stripping the electrons won't have anything to do with like alpha decay because that's no. a purely cool. nuclear process. And in the one case of potassium, it would give you anomalously old ages. Sure. So, it, oh, sorry, no, it would give you anomalously young age. It would go the opposite right. direction, right? It, so it, it would, would do the opposite of what you want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And in addition, the energy required for the piezoelectric effect to impact every mineral on, on Earth is likely going to result in some level of plasma formation, which would yep. one, be observable, but two, would just result in, in the vaporization of the Earth. Um, I, so we're doing really well so far. I think we're solving the heat problem, which is really You know, <laughs> Erica, I, I think you're going to need a lot of quartz to get that much electricity. Um, I think you but, are. My, I, I like the I like the second part of the piezoelectric uh, argument, which is that uh, the electricity from that is causing z pinching, which is uh, in turn in how you get uh, some of the heavy elements through cold fusion. Except that z pinching, we've never seen it do cold fusion. We've only ever seen it actually start off with hot fusion because z pinching is it's a method of compressing um, plasma using magnetic fields because you know because it's stripped of its electrons or so because plasma is essentially a free-flowing soup of electrons and nucleons or well nuclei um it's able to be manipulated by like or magnetic fields so with z-pinching you basically squeeze it really tight with a magnetic field until it can initiate fusion but that's not something that absorbs heat normally that's yeah. something that gives off heat normally so dumb. um you're not telling me that Z pinch in order to trigger this accelerated nuclear decay is going to worsen the heat problem, are you? Not only is it going to worsen the heat problem, it also won't accelerate decay. Instead, it will create fusion, which just creates more heavy elements, but won't actually result in things that you would see on, say, like a radiometric dating as just an older age than is realistic. Like that's none of that actually works. It's just taking some fancy terms from science that most people have never heard of and being like, oh yeah, it has to do with fission and creating, you know, heavy elements and that's really cool. And it's like, uh, okay, but yeah, that's not gonna help. 
if memory serves, quite a bit of the conversations about Z pinch occurs in papers on nucleosynthesis. Am mm -hmm. I correct on that? Mm. Well, yeah, uh, the way that they've talked about uh, Z pinch, at least to me, is as a way to generate radioisotopes or heavy elements. Mm -hmm. um, so rather than these heavy elements coming from neutron star collisions or something, it's from vibrating plates, shooting lightning bolts, and making yeah. fusion. Well, yeah, yeah. Actually, I want to mention that. So one of the ways that we get a lot of the heavy elements in the universe that we actually know of in terms of the, yeah, the energy levels work and we know that this event occurs is type 1a supernovae. But that is that is the kind of energy levels that we're requiring to get heavy elements, like beyond much beyond iron. And that kind of process, um, the Earth couldn't survive basically being a type 1a supernova. And the only other process that we know that really gets like heavier than iron are the normal stellar collapse supernovas, which again, not the kind of thing that the Earth could really survive happening all over the place, because that's the kind of energy levels we're talking about. The death of a supermassive star or a neutron star barely avoiding becoming a black hole by basically exploding. Um, that's, that's good to but, know. I'm sure that, I'm sure that, that would be, uh, that that's a great mitigation a great mitigation effort that's going to continue to be developed. I mean, to be fair, that will get a lot of energy away from the Earth by causing the Earth to literally explode. Awesome. What, what I like about the Z-Pinch argument is that it tracks back to uh, Walt Brown's blog where he's citing in a very obscure uh, Ukrainian source that you can't find online. So oh, surprise. Like, okay. Is that Whatever. Ukrainian source? Is that Ukrainian source not the one that was originally a lab that was actually a lab operating out of someone's house. If you actually go and check out check out their address on Google Maps, but it's actually no longer an operation even out of that individual's house. Um, I believe that was the case. I remember very well the the scan. Yeah, the Proton Twenty One Lab. Thank you, Creo Deep. Yep, that's that. it. Yep. Awesome. Cool. So, um, so it looks like Z pinch and the piezo piezo electro effect are, are are not going to do it for it. Well, the the one issue. And I haven't dug into Z pinch super in depth, but just uh, a couple things. First of all, um, it's it seems a little bit kind of special pleading because you're saying like all of the heavy elements on Earth were created by these vibrating plates, but like we can observe that there are heavy elements in stars very distant to us, right? So like God put heavy elements there, but not here. I mean, I guess He could have, but it seems kind of weird. Um, also, it he it would have to be orchestrated perfectly in just such a way that, for instance, you have the same prep, the same enrichment of uranium across the entire planet, you know? So like, it doesn't, it, it would have to be orchestrated in such a way that it creates U-235 and U-238 in the same ratio everywhere, which what? I haven't checked to see how likely that is. I don't know. It just seems like it's, it's very finely tuned, I guess. Well, see, but if you add miracles, then problem solved. I mean, I mean it, it yes. maybe, Maybe if it's all caused by the same thing, maybe if it's similar energy levels, it works. I don't know. It just, this is something you'd have to explain. Yeah, it's, it's very reminiscent. It's very reminiscent of the explanation that I've heard sometimes for uh, the Oklo reactor, right? It, very special pleading as far as trying to explain what we're, what we're seeing here, right? We, we're, we're observing a natural nuclear reactor, right? It, it's just it so cool. Seem, it's just it's, so cool. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> incredible in and of itself. We don't need to invoke, nor is it proper science, to invoke some wild mechanism that has never before been observed, ever, in order to get the Oklo reactor to look the way that it does, in some just-so fashion. Similarly so, with, um, with the, with the Z-Pinch on that scale, I suppose. You'd, I should you'd have to special plead in two directions with Oklo. So uh, for anyone who's not familiar, the, the naturally occurring reactor at Oklo um, basically requires natural uranium to be enriched at 3%. That's how much, that's the minimum level of enrichment you can have in order to sustain nuclear fission with light water. Um, so uh, the, the, the way it actually worked is if you go back in, pa in the past, uranium is more enriched in the past. So 2 billion years ago, it was sufficiently enriched for this to happen. If you want to say, well, Oklo's uranium was special. Okay, and it was more enriched than all the other uranium. 
okay, you can say that, I guess. God made Oklo special. Okay. So God made the uranium at Oklo at 3% or whatever he made it, such that it could sustain nuclear fission. And he made the uranium everywhere else the 0.7% we see. Okay. But then the fission happens at Oklo. And it fissions away its uranium and it depletes the uranium. So now it's a less, it's not 3% enriched, it's something less. And, but it's going to stop doing fission well before it gets to 0.7% enrichment. It just won't be able to sustain it anymore. So you'll be left at the end with fit with your enriched uranium. We'll say it's two and a half percent, something like that. Two and a half percent at Oklo and then 0.7% everywhere else. So the uranium at Oklo still has to have accelerated nuclear decay, but I guess none of the rest had accelerated nuclear decay then. Like, I don't know. It just doesn't make sense. It's it's very pick and choosy. The the entire situation is. I mean, when you guys were talking earlier about the, the piezoelectric effect, it's at, with its relation to potassium too. I mean, a lot of this has to be different accelerating decays or different acceleration of currently known rates occurring at different rates just to give the appearance that they currently corroborate one another. I mean, yeah. The, the, the classic example, Dapper and I talked about this on on our old Earth creationist uh, visit. To, to a channel last night, uh, but a, a classic example is how dates along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that you take with radiometric dating, they match what we see with rates at which the continents are currently moving apart, measurements that we get via satellites, right? So the movement of the tectonic plates right now matches the radiometric dates that we get from the seafloor spreading on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Those two things are completely independent. So if we're talking about accelerated rates during the flood, then the slowing down of the continental plates has to occur perfectly in tandem with the accelerated nuclear decay of everything along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge just to appear that they corroborate one another. That doesn't make any sense. I, I think that that touches on, on a fundamental problem that young Earth creationists have is they often want to, they invent a solution to this one problem, but then never apply that solution everywhere. And you can't just do that. Like you can't compartmentalize your problems. You need to come up with a model that like like one cohesive model and apply that to all situations. And if it fails any situation, there's a problem in your model that you need to fix. It's and then you go fix it. And right. then you apply it again to everything. You can't just apply it to this one thing. Right. Really quickly, Maddie from Science Side Up is here hanging out with us. Maddie, please introduce our, yourself and, and tell us a little bit about who you are. We're glad to have you here. And then I got to read a few super chats and then we'll hop right back in. Awesome. Oh, hi, team. I'm, I'm Maddie from Science Side Up. Uh, you can hear me talk about all kinds of fun science things over there. Um, so, yeah, my background, um, I'm a PhD student in meteorology at the moment, but I also spent four years as an instructor in the Navy teaching nuclear physics. So I heard you guys say nuclear things and I got excited. I was summoned just like the Babadook, maybe. I don't know. And I was good movie choice. Vibes for you. I was hoping that yeah. as you were speaking, you'd pick up on us and, and you know, zoom on over. <laughs> I did. Oh, and I also have a, my bachelor's was in math and earth atmospheric and planetary sciences. So I have such a weird science background that I love to talk about all this fun so stuff. I've got a heck of a topic that that is going to be great for for you and Jordan, and then we'll we'll move on. I know Dapper wants to talk about some of our orbital mechanics issues with uh, with hydroplate and CPT, but before we do, I want to read these super chats really quick. So from Vandalia, nineteen ninety eight, uh, he says, "Back from my vacation, ready to learn." Thank you for your two dollars, Vandalia. We love to have you here, and we also love learning. Ian Shen for five Aussie bucks says, "CPT caused fission." Learn some geology, kids. Very true, Ian. Ian solved the heat problem for us. Thank Yay, you. Yay, Ian. Yay. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Carrie Bronson for $5. Thank you, Carrie. Says, bananas are literally used as a unit for describing dose levels to lay people. Very true. Mm -hmm. I, and, you know, I, I do love a good banana. I'm, I, they're one of my least favorite fruits, but they're just so convenient with the little handle. It's almost like they're uh, you know, designed to fit in your hand like that. Just don't eat them on camera. Yeah, just don't even want to get. That's a good rule of thumb. Look, that's and a different kind of channel. That, that is a different kind of. Yeah, this isn't a this isn't a, a mukbang channel yet. <laughs> just, <laughs> Gary Bronson for twenty dollars says high doses of radiation will quickly kill off the gastrointestinal cells, so the victims die of diarrhea. The accelerated decay might very well have increased the magnitude of the poop problem in all caps, uh, capital P's, <laughs> several orders of magnitude. Quite true. That is something that I don't think some of the top minds over at AIG, ICR, CMI, and Associated 
YouTube conglomerates have considered quite so, that sounds like a shitty situation. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Get out. Now, our next our next subject. This one is just for, for Maddie and Jordan. And I'm very glad that I didn't bring it up right away because I this is classic for Maddie. Jordan did some math regarding a, a very recent mitigation effort for all of this heat uh, by using hypercanes. And I know Maddie loves the weather. She loves weather. She loves climate. So you guys want to tell me a little bit about how these hypercanes either are or are not going to remove, um, depending on what, which, which model we're working on, several um, vaporizations of the, of the Earth's granitic crust worth of heat. So I'm guessing by hypercane, you mean a really big hurricane? Yeah. So, so, so the way that the model... Mm -hmm. is that the oceans are heated up from all these various factors, right? So the oceans are hotter. Great. So that leads to bigger hurricanes, right? And so these hypercanes... No, then, but okay, continue. <laughs> these these hypercanes uh, dissipate a bunch of heat into space. Um, and that is one of the methods that they say will mitigate all of the heat we've been talking about. This, okay, uh, so really quick point on that. Like, <laughs> let's not forget that I, I think this idea of a hypercane kind of grew out of Michael Ord's thinking of how to grow ice sheets at a fast enough rate to explain how that you know, like we got such big ice sheets within yeah. a couple centuries. And so, to their credit, they're trying to solve two problems at least at once here. With hey, multitasking. That is yeah. rare. That is rare. We should give them a pat on the back for that. Although I don't. I don't 100%, I'm not 100% convinced that this wasn't unintentional. Like it's kind of a, oh crap, these hypercanes yeah. that we just used to solve our heat problem, like why don't we just use them and then make them snowy or cold and then we solve the hypercane <laughs> problem too. Yeah, so uh, all, I, all I did was I did some simple calculations because I'm not a meteorologist, yeah. I'm just a mechanical engineer. Okay. Uh, I just did I've some simple some calculations. i that set up. What are and we calculating? I'll, all, all, I, all I measured was I figured, okay, you've got this this black box of hypercane, okay. and it's getting water somehow that's hot. Mm -hmm. It condenses it, which means it's removing heat in order for it to condense, mm -hmm. and that goes somewhere, and then it falls back down as rain, right? And so I'm just I'm just mo I'm just basically modeling it as a heat engine. Okay. And I was like, okay, if that's the case, if you say the entire Earth is hypercanes and they last all year, and it somehow vents directly to space whatever if you do that it, it got rid of i forget the exact number but it was like 0.0001 percent of the, it wasn't even close so yeah. that's what i did and that okay. is the extent of my so, knowledge i'm gonna so give I, you oh. a gold i'm gonna give you a really big gold star jordan because um fun fact a hurricane is actually the closest thing to a true carnot cycle that exists nice um so modeling it as a real as like as a simple heat engine was uh, a very good instinct uh, well, Maddie. I wish I could claim 100% credit for that, but I took my lead from Noah on that. Back. Ah, okay. <laughs> What's up, uh, TD? Correct me if I'm wrong, but don't you need a large heat differential between the water and the air in order to actually have hurricanes form? Um. So. So no. Um. So. Okay. Uh. It, but. But before we do the ingredients you need to make a hurricane, right? So that's that's one thing. That's fine. Um, so one, the size of a hurricane is a function of the size of the planet, not how warm the ocean is because it's, it's all Coriolis, right? So order of magnitude, a hurricane is going to be a thousand kilometers across, right? Maybe it's really 600, maybe it's really 1200, something like that. But it, it's not going to be the size of America. It's not gonna be the size of Australia. You're not gonna get anything much bigger because of the strength of the Coriolis force, right? It makes it curve. You just can't get that bigger radius. It, it dissipates. So so what that means then, and, and tell me if I'm, I'm missing this as like a, as like a boneheaded non-meteorologist, non-physicist, but that would mean, right, that assuming you could get hurricanes to cover the entire planet, mega hyper hurricanes that are all dropping 50 times the regular amount of, of rainfall. You're, mm -hmm. And I, I actually saw Jordan's uh, presentation earlier today. So I happen to know that it gets rid of less than 0.02% of the heat. I know that off the top of my head because I checked. 
But you can't even do that because it's impossible to get hurricanes covering the entire surface of the planet if hurricanes are a function of the size of the planet. Is that correct, Nani? Yeah. Oh, um, my goodness. Oh, what Not only shame. that, but you're going to kind of balance out those big low pressure centers with like ridges. Yeah. So where's the high pressure going to be? Right. So what I'm just trying to think of, how would I make one hurricane this big? Right. How would I make one that's going to fit this? But you're absolutely right, because a hurricane is like the center of it is a low pressure system. Uh, it's anom anomalously low. That means somewhere else it needs to be high. Right. <laughs> Everywhere can't be low pressure um, or else you don't get a storm. Um, so I, I had a question that came up in my mind when I was originally doing this model that mm -hmm. I didn't delve into because it didn't matter, mm -hmm. but it rejects the heat. Um, I assume it doesn't actually reject the heat to space, right? It rejects right. it back to the atmosphere. That was that was my next thing. So yeah. um, team, uh, there are four main layers to our atmosphere, right? The troposphere down here at the surface and then the stratosphere above that, then the mesosphere, then the thermosphere all weather happens in the troposphere. And if you've ever seen a picture of a hurricane and you've noticed that its top is flat, mm. right? Right? That's because it's yeah. hitting the top of the troposphere. It's called the tropopause. And it, oh. it's actually really hard for air to go from the tropopause, uh, excuse me, to go across the tropopause, to go from the troposphere mm. into the stratosphere. So, <laughs> and, and believe it or not, the updraft of a hurricane isn't super, super strong. Well, it's, it's strong, but not as strong as, say, the updraft from a tornado, right? So the updraft from the hurricane, it goes up, it hits the tropopause. And for this purpose, you can think of that as a cap. It's a ceiling, right? It hits it and it can't go anywhere. So it spreads out and then falls back down. And that's how you get your convecting cells. Mm -hmm. So there are miles of space, miles of air between the top of the hurricane and outer space. Okay, so <laughs> so let's so that's even assuming like assuming you could get the worldwide hurricanes, they're not even capable of spitting this heat up to where it could be potentially cooled because we you, yeah. I don't know if you caught us. Absolutely not. It just recycles it back into the troposphere. The only awesome. way we use is lose heat to space is radiative loss, right? Awesome. Ah, uh, but Maddie, what about increasing the albedo of the planet slightly? Or actually, quite a lot. That means we're getting a whole lot less solar energy. So, I mean, you know, we're less thermal input. More. We're not right. adding more. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but we melt all the ice. And so you can increase clouds, which will increase your albedo. But if you get rid of ice, then you've dramatic. Most of our albedo is from ice. Well, this is this is a fun one for, for Jonathan to add to very briefly, because if I'm remembering correctly, as far as the younger creationists uh, models go, there just isn't any ice until the first ice age after the flood, where we get one mega ice age and that's it. So how, how do you feel about that, Jonathan? Well, um, a couple of quick points. Uh, first to Maddie's point. So the way they use this word hypercane is as a, a super strong hurricane. Not necessarily super large, but extra strength, and and that's by modeling a, a hurricane under extremely warm sea surface temperatures. No, not like 20, 25 Celsius, but actually 50 something degrees. Hmm. Uh, okay. Because in their mind, like the 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 water really is that hot at okay. the surface, and yet and all ocean life forms are surviving this just fine. Yeah. Right. Yeah. What, what, this is fine. What what I kind of wonder about is how storms like that, just how stable storms like that could be? Um, do they go over land? Does land exist? Oh, well, yeah, that's that's the other thing to consider. I mean, so if, if it's in so, a water yeah, so, covered scenario, sure. But otherwise they're using this as a mechanism to like drive precipitation. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. as, okay. as, a quick, as a quick aside for our, for our meteorologist and for our geologist here, uh, Creo Debunk in the side chat wants to ask, and I think this is this is quite um, relevant. How do we know that there have been multiple ice ages rather than just one? Oh, temperature records. Well, there you go. And yeah. how do we get these temperatures? Is it perhaps by ice cores? Ice cores is a great tool. Um, there's other tools for studying paleoclimate. Uh, so, so one of the favorite tools is going to be um, the little little sh mollusk shell guys. They're 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 great for studying the temperature of things. Thanks, uh, Shelly boys. If I may, Lake Farves are another. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
like barfs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As much as Orin and hates them. You can go through those if you want. Well, I want to ask a real quick question. These relatively independent proxies for temperature data tend to correlate strongly across time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> funny, funny that. Funny that. Um, but yeah, that was actually, if you go back in the temperature record, like, like there is the periodic, we have periodic ice ages about every 100,000 years, um, which corresponds to the uh, Milinkovitch cycle of the Earth's um, eccentricity. Uh, so when we are more elliptical orbit, where we're going to be in, in that ice age, when we're in a more circular orbit, we're going to be in not an ice age. And that, that change happens over about 100,000 years or order of magnitude. So to, to add on that, um, those, sorry, those uh, glacial volume records, I mean, they come from the marine sediments mainly, mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking at benthic foraminifera and its oxygen isotope signal. So by combining the oxygen isotope signal with the magnesium calcium ratio, and uh, you know, which is an independent temperature proxy, we can extract the seawater delta ATNO signal. So seawater delta ATNO is a function of ice volume because the more ice that's on land, uh, the less of the, or sorry, the more ice you have on land, the more of the heavy oxygen isotope is in the oceans at large. So it's a simple mass balance calculation. So by, by looking at that swing in delta ATNO back through time, uh, we can sort of back calculate what the glacial volume is. And so the main driver of that is the obliquity cycle of, at 41,000 years, but it gets, um, multiplied by the other. So the effect of that gets multiplied and also gets multiplied by the average glacial extent and ambient temperature of the earth. So as you go through like the Pliocene, you know, to the Pleistocene and, and to modern day, like through the Quaternary, about that, about at that Pliocene, the Pleistocene transition, that obliquity cycle becomes quite well expressed. Uh, and specifically, um, uh, since that boundary at like 2.6 million years ago, which is not that long ago in the marine record, uh, there are something like 52 glacial advances recorded in the marine ice cores. Now, but that's a number that's bigger than one, right? It is, yeah, I think so. Okay, Wait, okay. Let me check. I just want, well, has, creationists are sometimes bad at math, so I want to establish the greater than, less than, you know. Yes, it is much greater than one. I mean, but as an engineer, I can confirm it is. Let, let okay. me just uh, emphasize, though, that like from from this marine record, we can only hypothesize, like we can hypothesize that it was glacial advances and retreats that were doing this, and and so by using the time scale in that marine record, we can like look at terrestrial records as well. For example, we find evidence of glacial advances with moraines and tills and uh, paraglacial lakes and braided streams and stuff, like all the sedimentary evidence matches the timing, of course, of, of those glacial advances in the isotope record. So even if somebody wanted to suggest like, this is not like, these aren't real ice ages or glacial advance, well, yeah, they are. I mean, they correspond to the terrestrial record uh, which which is dated like through multiple methods, you know, from radiocarbon to uh, luminescence dating to uranium thorium dating and uh, so forth. So there's like these are well dated. Um, the other record that we commonly look at are the LUS, the glacial LUS records, which mm. is a windblown dust, and these are hundreds of meters thick if in parts of Asia, and record several million years of glacial advance and retreat. But what's interesting about that is you have like LUS records where it's glacial, like windblown dust, evidence of permafrost, cryogenic cracking in the layers. And then you go from that to like a, pe a paleosol. So you have yeah. well-formed soils, warm adapted plants, and then you go back to the glacial loss. And then you go back to the, you know, it's, it, so these. So, yeah, it, I think, I think that's something that's rarely appreciated. And, you know, I being a, again, a, a non-meteorology, non-paleontology lunkhead, I, or geology for that matter, I tend to understand it strictly in like the, the big classics, like the, the big five mass extinctions are these massive fluctu fluctuations in, in biodiversity, general biomass and, and uh, temperature swings, things of that nature. But this kind of thing happens periodically as well as, as you guys have just outlined, like with glacial advances and retreats, with, with natural Milankovitch cycles going you know to and fro. And it makes it very difficult to to cope with, particularly the ones that are that are related to the orbit of the planet. 
because you can't exactly speed up the orbit of the planet for for the single year of the global flood in order to account for these for these diagnostic characteristics of different periods of the Milankovitch cycle. Would that be a fair characterization? You'd have to speed up the Earth. You'd have to add more energy with in order to and and speeding up the orbit also changes the distance we are from the sun because they're related. So yeah. you'd, you'd yeah. cause more problems than you could possibly solve. I, I want to point out one thing is um, to speed up the orbit, you actually have to lose energy because paradoxically faster orbits are lower, which means right. they actually have less energy. So it's orbital mechanics yeah, is right. weird that way. Yeah, you would lose energy. But in any case, you would change the orbit significantly, which would also change the temperature. So if you're speeding up the orbit, you'd be closer to the sun, which means it's hotter, which is the opposite of what you were trying to do. Uh, right. We need to slow, if anything, slowing the Earth down by raising its orbit might help a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. So speaking of orbital mechanics, because I know Dapper wanted to discuss oh, yes. work on orbital mechanics. Uh, so okay, please, but at oh, some wait, point I, I want to get back to what kills hurricanes. Yes. Just, okay. oh. Would you I, would you like to wrap that up first, maybe, since we're already we're still on the topic? We'll I'm okay with that. To yeah. Sorry, let me get this out of my head before take it away before it runs away. Okay. So how how to kill a hurricane? Um, the easiest way. So you, it's you know we think about hurricanes where the warm ocean water is their power source, right? Um, so the easiest way to kill a hurricane is to move it over land, and then you take away its power source, right? So, but if we're thinking that this is like a, if this is, you know, cause you can do um, simple climate models where there is no land, it's just ocean, right? Now, how do we kill a hurricane? Um, you can move it, you can try to move it over the equator, right? Hurricanes don't like that because Coriolis goes to zero. That's what causes the rotation. It's gonna fall apart. Um, you can try to move it too far north Part of that is also removing, um, you're removing heat because it's now going over cold water. So I don't know how that would work with the crazy temperatures we're thinking about here. Um, but that also Coriolis is actually getting stronger. So it, it would tend to try to spin in a tighter thing and to get smaller as you go north. Um, and that seems like something's gonna break. Uh, and it would also like, now it's gonna interact with the jet stream. And I feel like you're gonna get a crazy high shear environment and it's gonna rip it apart. So another great way to to kill a hurricane is to have really strong wind shear because um, it can actually tip. Uh, so uh, you have wind speeds increase a lot as you with height. You can that can actually tip over that central column, um, and so it can destroy it. And uh, so shear environment, cold, um, and I, I'm trying to think of how oceans would behave where the surface layer is really, really warm, right? Do we still have cold water below? Because if we're thinking about a system that's trying to live for a really long time, are you going to have cold upwelling ocean water? Also, ocean spray, can that can start to mess with stuff? Um, so um, that's th that's how to kill a hurricane. And, and Maddie frantically tried to think of how this would work on a, on a fictional planet. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we're doing, since we're assuming D&D &D rules already, I mean, yeah. we might as well play around with our with our right. Wait, How dare you malign D&D &D by associating with this? <laughs> Listen, <Hey. laughs> we're playing tomorrow night. We are, <laughs> um, we are. Reminder. Roll 1d20 for, to see if you uh, have catastrophic heat problem. Yeah, oh, that's a disadvantage. Let me get, you, let me get a d20 out. Yeah. You need a couple of nats board this heat problem. I rolled a 16. I got a three. So uh, you, the entire planet is melted and turned to plasma. Yeah. It's not looking good. <laughs> Rock we all But yeah, that, that reminds me. So TD Lane, Erica, myself, and Science Side Up. So, you know, two thirds of this panel can be seen on Cheshire Vic's channel tomorrow playing Dungeons and Dragons and also providing a link if you want to, to give to an educational charity. <laughs> and we'll what give time? more information on the day. Um, yeah. It's at... A time that I totally remember. It's at six it, central. Perhaps, yep, six yeah. central. Exactly. I remember that. Exactly on the dot. So Dapper, and we'll we'll plug that again at the end. I want everybody to have an opportunity to to kind of plug plug themselves and what they're up to. Dapper, tell us about this orbital mechanical work that you've been doing because I feel like that adds a little bit extra of an energy problem. All right. But first I want to say I during this stream I redecorated and no one noticed. I noticed. I just didn't say anything because okay. I, I thought you had done it 
or I, I didn't busy, count listening. myself as having not noticed the previous. No, it was in the middle of the stream that I redecorated because that video that I'm using as this loop hadn't finished compiling until during the stream. Well, we'll forgive you for the inconsistency. Just this one. <laughs> All right. So this point I'm going to make here is very specific to uh, the hydroplate model. So it, if you're holding to, you know, uh, catastrophic plate tectonics, or you're trying to argue against catastrophic plate tectonics, this is not going to really be an issue. But <clears throat> um, the hydroplate model suggests that all of the craters that we see across all bodies in the solar system that aren't volcanic are the result of ejecta from Earth, of specifically water, as well as all of the asteroids that we see, both long and short period. Not, sorry, not asteroids, comets, excuse me, are also ejecta from Earth. So all this water has to come from Earth. Now, I'm not. I'm going to ignore the fact that there is an amount of mass involved in the known icy bodies that make up the asteroids in terms of, I keep saying it, comets, in terms of long period comets that would make Earth uh, have several hundred times its current mass. We're, we're going to just pretend that that's not an issue for the pre-flood world, right? Ignore that. I'm also going to ignore all the energy it would take to pelt all the bodies in the solar system with the currently observed impact craters. I'm going to ignore that too. What I want to know is how much energy it takes to get the Kuiper belt, which is apparently made up of ejecta, to its present location. And I'm ignoring the extra energy it requires to go from being in that location to being in orbit at that location. Not even going to worry about it. Okay? Now, to make the math ever so slightly easier... I rounded the mass of the Kuiper belt from um, 1.9 times 10 to the 28th kilograms to 2. However, I also used the most generous um, mean orbital distance for the Kuiper belt of only 25 AU as opposed to the more likely 40 to 50. So I'm being extremely generous. I'm giving a lot of breaks here to creationism. And so remember, this isn't even just to get them into orbit. This amount of energy is what it would take to get them there, and then they would just fall back anyway. Okay, so it's going to require 3.496 times 10 to the 37, to, sorry, times 10 to the 37 joules, which is the amount of energy the sun releases in 29,000 years. And if you were to have this being released over the surface of the earth, over the course of, say, 140 days, which I gave as a reasonable length of time for the flood, right? We're talking about 219 million Hiroshima bombs per second per square meter over the course of 140 days. Yeah. That seems fine. It's, it's doable. It, you just have to invoke a couple of miracles. That's, that's <laughs> just, just, like just a few. Just a little well, bit of water, you know? I mean, on the upside... That method, if somehow you transferred the heat from the radioactive decay and everything, if somehow you managed to transfer all the heat into ejecta and launch the orc crowd, that would actually be enough, right? Because it, it's 10 to the 30, you said uh, the 37, and my calculations for nuclear decay is to the 30th, and I don't know what the plate model is, it's probably not more than the 37th. So, hey, they have, they've got the seeds of a workable there, model. There, you there know? you go, guys. <laughs> That you think there's a way to like belt? direct this energy, this entropy, everything else into ejecting, ejecting <laughs> well, like, something I, into I'm, space? I'm just imagining like, okay, so you've got the Earth and it's ejecting this stuff, right? Like, there's conservation momentum, so that's going to change the Earth's orbit. Like, you'd have to somehow eject it perfectly in every direction in order not to mess up the orbit. If it were somehow preferentially on one side or another, you would maybe change the Earth's orbit. I'm imagining the Earth is like like a rocket now, like ejecting you the stuff. So, yeah. Shooting ejecta <laughs> everywhere, yeah. Well, and, and you know, the, the, I believe it was, I think it was Gerard Jellison. He's a physicist who covered hydroplate a, a, a couple of years ago. And he did extensive work on it. I corresponded with him when I was making my hydroplate video. And I, I believe it was him who, who did the math on this. But let's say, for example, that we're, let's give it to him. Let's say hydroplate's going to work and we can get all that energy to eject all that Earth ejecta to account for all the cratering on all of the planets in the solar system. And moons. Yeah, and moons, which is what Walt Brown requires. So here's the interesting thing about that. Based on the crater sizes and what we've got floating around in the asteroid belt, 
that's several times the mass of the Earth. Like, we don't have enough ejecta uh, actually, to put out there. If it's just the Kuiper, if it's just the Kuiper belt, we don't, and not even accounting for impact craters, it's 10,000 times the current mass of the Earth in wa primarily water ejecta, which means that the flood isn't a whole bunch of water arriving on the, on the surface of the Earth. It's apparently the entire Earth, which was already under, you know, miles of water, losing that water somehow because so the pre flood ocean went, man. Th think about adding 10,000 times the current mass of the earth in water to the earth it would just be a ball of water well i, I have a counterpoint I, I have a counterpoint that creationists okay. will use which is that everything we've talked about thus far all that math is completely wrong because you see it's not based on the assumptions of the creationist model because in the creationist model the pre-flood world which you have to use to make your assumptions right uh, the Earth was actually 90% tropical rainforest and, like, 10% water, which I'm certain works, from, like, with a water cycle and such, and oh, definitely cool. isn't and completely not functional. It's all good. It, we, no one worry about any of the cycles, I promise. <laughs> we have a question, though, and that no I, I think is interesting. It's from Zandre Tuber, which is an interesting name. Uh, why are you guys even trying to disprove creationism with such outdated and ideological theory? That's almost childish to do so right now with an XI emoji. And so my question is, by outdated model or theory, do you mean like basic physics? Because that's what we're using. Well, I, I think if, you, if you're reading it, it says, why are you guys even trying to disprove creationism? Yeah. That's such an outdated model. I'm saying oh, creationism is outdated. Yeah. Okay, then maybe I've just read. My I wish, apologies. Nice I wish job. it was outdated. Listen, like, yeah. as in no one did it. That, that, was, that was my take as well, Jordan. I, because I really, I wish Sondre was correct on this. I wish that we didn't, that this panel wasn't necessary. I yeah. wish it were outdated, right? Right. It, yeah, this, I mean, I... Sandra, for, for the record, you know, I, I don't know where you live. I, I live in the United States, and I went to the Creation Museum in the Ark Encounter a couple weeks ago, which are uh, younger creationist museums, if you will, um, and, and they were packed. I mean, there there's a non a non zero percentage of the country that you, of the United States that really does buy into this. It's small and it's shrinking, but that being said. It's still there, which is why yeah. we are of the opinion, and I think I can speak for the panel when I say this, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but it's important that these resources are available to people. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, actually, sorry, go ahead. I, so I was actually asked um, recently, like, why do you care? And I said, look, I don't really care that much if all it is is someone believes that the Earth is 6,000 years old and gets biology badly wrong. Because ultimately, that's not going to be too much of a problem for me or them. However, uh, rejecting science is usually not an isolated incidence. And so there's a high correlation between things like anti-vax or accepting uh, already disproven aspects of you know, um, alternative medicine yeah. and just a general anti-intellectualism that comes with creationism. Because if you – to be a creationist – you have to think that basically the entire field of science is more or less BS. So it's no wonder that we have a high correlation between people who are suspicious of vaccines and who have various other anti-science attitudes, including creationism. So all of it is tied together. And if I, and I know that I have, because I've talked to people who have in fact moved away from young earth creationism as a result of my efforts, if I can take people and move them away from an anti-science stance and towards a pro-science stance, I consider that having helped the world as a whole. Yeah, it's it's an important it's an important uh, responsibility as Dapper uh, and Maddie and I discussed on on uh, the OE's stream the other day. It's an important responsibility of, of folks who have the privilege to to get educated in these kinds of topics to make that kind of understanding accessible to to folks who who aren't, and I rely on people like that, like most of our panel, to inform me, to help inform me and help me understand the areas that I'm not formally educated in. Uh, that's the duty of, of the of the informed. Um, so. I think it's also we... worth pointing out that uh, it's, it's, it's a widespread US problem 
and but not just here and and there's some many mm -hmm. countries where it's kind of growing or like yeah. getting out from under this uh, out from under the rock so to speak and people are just now like trying to address it like well where did this come from how do we like yeah we don't speak this language we don't know how and and so i've seen a lot of people especially from like the netherlands scandinavia uh trying to counter these pop-up groups and whatnot can i um just say the interesting comment in the chat that the uh Earth's magnetic field has been decaying as long as we've measured it to know about that. That's, oh, um, I know about that. <laughs> Absolutely not true. That, <laughs> is, that, that is from our friend Otangelo. He I know. That <laughs> same point over and over again, as well as many of his other, I mean, sorry, Otangelo, but like this galloping with points that I know I specifically have covered with you before. So no one block Otangelo as long as he's not spamming, but if he starts to spam Otangelo, please just behave yourself in no that, that's okay i just i just want to say no it's it that's not how <laughs> it's not the case at all uh, and no, sure. uh be happy to elaborate in detail if you want to contact me directly but can i make an unpopular opinion here i don't think there is a heat problem in young earth creationism uh -oh. and I, that's a I, hot take hot take <laughs> not even the creationists tend to agree i i say that because the justification is totally lacking and you have to th like the justification from the radiation point of view it, it kind of springs out of this rate project you know which, which i remember was just getting started i think when i was in middle school or high school or something and, and i remember hearing about it like thinking oh i wonder what they're going to come up with and i i kind of lost touch with it for a while and then all of a sudden they came out and said well we realized that geochemical evidence for you know radiometric dating is pretty solid and the only way to explain this is just by adjusting those decay constants so i guess that's what we have to do um but that's not i mean th there is no problem here with the radiometric dating and 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 with the geochronological techniques or the record that we come up with i mean that that's everything there is quite solid and what the weird examples that they use to say ah here's here's where you have evidence of accelerated decay or just completely bunk especially at the top of the list this whole zircon helium nonsense um and i and i say that is nonsense because like this is uh, for many of them a major justification this is why you have to believe that there was some change in the decay right this accelerated nuclear processes uh, or little examples like this and i think like you've got samples that were you know measured maybe sort of for helium uh, retentivity like decades ago and we've got a couple samples maybe they were examined for their uranium thorium lead systematics but not in the same sample not using the quality checks that people use i i think that a lot of the younger people just don't realize that uranium thorium helium is a very common geochronological method like for dating especially the uplift of uh terrains because you can use the uranium thorium systematics to, you know, to, to estimate how much alpha decay you would have, you know, how many alpha particles emitted. And then you could look at the helium diffusivity of that mineral and, and use that to estimate how long it's been since that mineral reached this closure temperature, closure temperature being at what point does that helium diffusion go down to you know so low that the system can kind of remain close since then. So it's a very solid technique, it's widely used. And if Humphreys wanted to make his point with actual scientists, if he wanted to make it persuasive to anybody who knows what he's talking about, all he'd have to do would be like get samples, one where he measured helium and uranium and thorium in the same sample and did the spot analysis across the entire zircon with the with the elemental mapping and all these other you know radiation damage and uh, other checks you know quality checks for that method all you have to do is show that this is a consistent signal that you have too much helium in zircons or any other mineral for that matter across the earth and how many times do you think he tried to replicate those results outside of these samples i mean we don't even know what samples they used i mean they're, they're like really old samples where they measured the helium and you know, some other ones that it's it's such a mess and and really if you want to convince anybody just do that again but but I, you don't even have to do it because we already know like the thousands and thousands of data published with uranium thorium lead helium data out there 
completely so, contradict everything you know that every, everything that he's claiming from this. Oh, so we don't even need to talk about the heat that would be produced by accelerated decay because there's no justification for it, even within decay, this right. creation model, right? So Jonathan, I actually have a question for you because like um, when I try to explain why the the helium and zircon thing is not like that's not that's not a thing that we need to think about. Um, I'm try I, I I usually try to explain it as um, it seems like it seems to me that the especially when you listen to some of the young Earth creationism like more of their air quote science communicators, they seem to be under the impression that you have all of the helium from all of the decays is produced all at once and it's just there and that that diffuses out and we right so like they're not allowing for like this is a decay process helium is being constantly produced right and so exactly that, yeah okay, it, it is constantly produced and let's keep in mind that if it were produced in this really short time frame that's been accelerated there yeah. would be no mineral there to measure uranium thorium or helium in especially Absolutely. helium like, okay. how do you think that stays in the rock? Uh, I mean, like, one thing you do in this method, by the way, is check for radiation damage because every, when there are alpha particle emissions, ejections, uh, it causes dislocations in that crystal lattice. It creates a pathway for helium to escape more easily than a standard diffusion model would predict, right? Uh, so that radiation damage, though, can't even exist uh, certainly not as we measure it, if you have this accelerated into a very short time span. I mean, either the mineral is too soft, literally, or um, all those ejecta would be like so destructive that we would still see them everywhere throughout the zircon. But uh, the, the number of those, um, sorry, the number, number of those paths, like the, you can count, you can etch the zircon, you can see them, uh, those fission tracks, sorry. Uh, it doesn't even come anywhere close to matching the um, the number you would expect to see if this were somehow accelerated within recent millennia. Like that, it, that stuff with the fission tracks, I just want to add this in because I, I thought it was absolutely incredible. I witnessed a couple of months ago in a discussion about the heat problem, um, that, uh, all this, this, you know, heat being a huge issue, assuming accelerated nuclear decay was already a thing, is, is the model tends to do. And uh, the, the, the individuals who were discussing it were like, look, we see fission tracks, which are, of course, very sensitive to annealing and heat and all that kind of stuff. And so because of that, obviously, there wasn't a heat problem. And, and that was it. That was the solution. There couldn't have been a heat problem because fission tracks exist. And my jaw kind of dropped because that's the kind of circular reasoning that you would hope would be above, you know, like a like a high school reading level, typically. Well, it's it. So if you read like Snelling or something, he the way he talks about it is that um, you see fission tracks, we see the uranium halos, we see these things, and these things would take a hundred million or however many years to get to, to to happen, and therefore accelerated nuclear decay had to have happened. So he's saying because fission tracks, we have to have accelerated decay. So in order, like you said, if you say, well, because fission tracks, no accelerated decay, that completes the circle, you know, um, yeah. Which, which the question is, you know, I mean, we've discussed here on this channel before why fission tracks are, are not even in the ballpark of a, justify, of a justification rather for accelerated nuclear decay. But even assuming that it were, that kind of circular reasoning it, it's it's fallacious. It doesn't work. No. Why, if accelerated nuclear decay is this is this massive global phenomenon, fission tracks shouldn't be the only place that you're that you're sussing it out. Well, I mean, even at a bare minimum, even if we're accelerating to the point where it wasn't catastrophic, at the very least, you should see extensive metamorphosis in basically everything that would otherwise be igneous, right? Because at the very least, it's going to have to release some extra heat. It's going to have some effect on the rocks involved. But instead, in all these rocks that are like, oh, look, maybe this is evidence of uh, accelerated decay. We don't see the uh, amount of metamorphosis that we would expect, right? So uh, even at a bare minimum, why aren't we seeing more metamorphosis in igneous rocks that contain radioactive elements? 
oh, maybe it's because they're not releasing extra heat because of accelerated decay. I don't know. Well, you see, you see, Dapper, Dapper, the, the, there's a simple thing. Um, in, in reality, uh, for the Young Creationist model, uh, if there were a heat problem, then all this evidence of these fission tracks would be erased. And if there weren't a heat problem, then they would be there, clearly. So uh, no matter what you do, uh, we're, we're right, you're wrong. Uh -huh. let, me just, let me just summarize that uh, fission, tra I mean, fission track dating is, is commonly used. Those data do reveal, they do reveal coherent thermal histories of the rocks that they're used on. Uh, I mentioned uranium, thorium, helium as a thermochrono thermochronometric method, like dating when this rock passed through a certain temperature threshold. But zircon and helium, these are, these are just one mineral, one decay path. I mean, you can apply the same sort of technique to other minerals like apatite that have lower closure temperatures. And so you can not only get the date at which it passed through like 100, you know, 200 degrees Celsius, 150 degrees, all the way down to like 60 degrees centigrade, right? The, the decay history. And what do you know the age gets younger with the lower closure temperature as though the rock was slowly cooling off being uplifted uplifted toward the surface so these i mean these are quite consistent there's i i don't know how you can look at this and say uh it's somehow a challenge i, so, I know how so okay dapper go ahead and i have something oh it's, it's real quick it's by being this thing that we like to call dishonest yes that's that's one way to do it um can I get, I, I want to give you like two more reasons if you don't yeah, mind yeah, please, that, please, go ahead. that there's not a heat problem. No, reason number two, a lot of this, I mean, when, when you talk about the accelerated decay and, and all the other possibly miraculous things that had to happen, you know, during the flood or before the flood, uh, kind of gets away from the discussion of what happened since then. I mean, if we want to look at the Holocene, Pleistocene, Pliocene record, and the very different decay techniques, I mean, the, the radiometric techniques that we use and the luminescent techniques and others that we use to date those sediments, those deposits all the way back to several million years. Is this also subject to accelerated decay? Because you could look at, you know, say radiocarbon gets you back this far, about to 50,000 years, but then uranium thorium overlaps with that. And we use them to corroborate each other by dating the same materials. Uh, I mean, if you want a good example of that, look at the INTCAL project, which is, you know, done to calibrate the radiocarbon curve, but mm -hmm. it's built by dating through radiocarbon method and uranium thorium method, the same materials in speleothems, corals, and other things, right? Uh, I mean, it's beyond that, I mean, we've got the uranium protactinium decay series. We've got, as I mentioned, the luminescent data series. I mean, just in, just in speleothems, and one thing that you know I covered when I was on here last time, Erica, the fact that independently we have speleothem records dated back to about 650,000 years that independently give you that same insulation curve predicted by the, Malink the Malinkovich cycle, right? The, the, the quaternary is so problematic for young earth creationism specifically because it is very clearly not showing this acceleration that is required for what is considered flood rock immediately. Preceding. Right. And let me, let me highlight that these are not flood rocks at all. These are, this has to happen afterward because these are in caves that need time to dissolve out. So you need a cavity to form. First, mm. the rock has to solidify to a point that can even host a cavity. Then the cavity itself has to dissolve out, then these speleothems have to form. Surprise. So you have 650,000 years, and it's not like these are the oldest. I'm just gonna give an example where it's extremely well correlated to a uh, Milankovitch cycle here. So we have independent ways of uh, corroborating the age model, right? Yeah. Um, so you have 650,000 years worth of decay in something that had to form well after the flood, right? Yes. So we um, the rapid yeah. lithification is one of those things, and yet I find so mind-bogglingly dumb. And I think the the geologists in there realize that, like, we can't explain this at you, all. You're you're one hundred percent right, TD. We we have a question from Christopher Cohen, super chat for five dollars, and I believe we also had one from uh, someone else. I want to go back and I'm gonna just double check. 
Uh, and I think this is probably to say more towards the end, but they say I'm religious and I accept evolution, uh, ancient earth, modern cosmology, etc. So some members of the panel. Many of my friends and family are steeped in YC. How do I reach them? And so I think we should go and maybe we'll, we'll finish the, the topic with regard to the heat problem. And then if we want to discuss that at the end, I think that'd be a good idea. Thank you for your super chat, uh, Christopher. Um, very briefly, I, I want to highlight something that I think is, is very interesting. We had someone in the side chat. It was actually our friend Otangelo who, who linked a, a new solution to the heat problem, right, from 2018 Ooh. by Humphreys et al., or actually, I think it was just on Mr. Mr. Wilford literally covered it in chat. He, he did. He did. But I already had the the actually highlighted conference from Humphreys himself because the paper that was linked by uh, Otangel, who's a younger creationist, for this brand new solution to the heat problem, which is, of course, the expansion of space. When I listed that early on in our PowerPoint as one of the potential solutions to the heat problem, Humphreys himself has mentioned in that very article that this solution has to be supernatural. Because were it not, all of the organisms would would experience the opposite of the heat problem, which is they freeze to death. This is this is not doable. His his precise quote goes something along these lines. He says he so Humphreys abandons vol, uh, volumetric cooling, which is the idea from the original rate project in 2018. He realized the rapid expansion of space, while it would solve the heat problem, would also freeze the Earth solid and kill everything on the Ark. In 2020, he admitted that his ideas about the heat leakage into hyperspace are not natural processes and are in fact divinely controlled. In other words, they're miracles. So his quote is, two factors are accelerated nuclear decay and accelerated volume cooling, both during the Genesis flood and before it. Neither factor occurs, which is uh, the qualifier low shelf, which is the individual he's citing, seems to have missed in my statement. Temperatures in the formation could not change much. Uh, in only thousands of years. Using two processes, God could adjust the temperatures in the rocks. I mentioned this, of course, in the PowerPoint, uh, to whatever he wanted. Temperatures both rising and falling during both periods, uh, the Antediluvian Age and the year of the flood, which, of course, echoes the sentiment that we mentioned at the beginning of the stream, which is the professional young Earth creationists who are working on the heat and radiation problem understand that this is a problem that requires miracles to solve. Mm -hmm. that, that is, that is the, the thesis statement of this stream. You're going to solve the heat problem with miracles or you're not going to solve it. So I, I, I want to say something about that. And it's like, okay, look, if you want to invoke miracles all the way down to explain whatever it is that you think is the true history of the planet, I'm not going to tell you you can't. But you need to stop pretending that this has any scientific validity whatsoever. Because I'm not saying miracles don't happen. I don't really care. But science can't use them because we can't make predictions based on miracles created by the will of an intelligent agent God who just sometimes does things that break the laws of physics. We can't do we can't make predictions on that. We can't make models on that. It's not science. So feel free to believe in that, but stop pretending that it's science. It's not science. It's not going to get into classrooms. It doesn't make any reasonable predictions that we can actually use in the real world. It doesn't do any of the things that science does. Just go have your fun little club where you believe in all these miracles that help you explain away the fact that God is apparently, if you're right, one of the biggest liars in the world and have fun with it. And then also go get vaccinated. Do get vaccinated. Yes. This channel, 100 I'm vaccinated 100%. Um, I'm fully vaccinated. I, I imagine Same. the entire panel is. Um, but yeah, I... This I is literally just got my second shot last week. Congratulations. Jeez. Yeah. Congrats. So happy. Sorry. I'm just like, I'm still shocked that I was able to get both of mine in March. Yes. Wow. Yeah. I'm a that's a lot earlier than I did. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Was earlier. it the uh, higher education bump? Um, actually, it was because out here in, I'm in Oklahoma. Um, and uh, the the Nobody tribe. Oh, no, 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 it's not that. It's actually that the tribes had a really big push. Um, and so I am, I am also an enrolled member of the Cherokee tribe. And so ah. I was able to get mine through the tribes earlier, but they also then just had like the tribes had extra. So then they also vaccinated anybody in education, um, regardless of native status. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. That's good. I, th I think it was a similar situation where I'm at and, um, higher education got through pretty quickly, like January, February. So it was pretty impressive. Yeah, that's that's 
so good. Oh, our friend Otangela in the chat has also had his first vaccination. Congratulations, Otangela. That's awesome. Awesome. I, oh, I, I hope that second one is just as easy to get. Me too. Yeah, because I, I, I don't know where he's at. It, and it look, I want to say, when I say go get vaccinated, I'm not implying that every young Earth creationist is the anti-vaxxer. That was not my implication. <laughs> It was just sort of a, a, a tongue-in-cheek, but also, yeah, do do that kind of recommendation. Like, everyone should go get vaccinated. It's If you're in the United States, it's free. And in most places in the United States, they're now doing walk-in vaccinations. So, I, I think in many parts of the world, it's uh, like this as well, even, even for non-citizens. I mean, it's getting to that point. And also, out here you know, case numbers are back up to where they were in February and March. Yeah, in the U.S. It's... Here, here too. Right. But the thing is, I, essentially all of the new cases are among unvaccinated people. It's 99%. Yeah. yeah. Which, I mean, this really shows the, the problem, like, like you said earlier, Dino, of, have, of not being scientifically literate, of not properly applying skepticism, like the... Like normally in your everyday life, if you believe that aliens abducted Farmer John, like whatever, but not having a proper grounding in the scientific method and stuff like that can have real effects that actually mm -hmm. really kill people, you know? Uh, yeah. we, I want to use a real world example from recently. We can see how the GOP kind of absorbed uh, climate denialism and then went in heavily into anti intellectual, and now they're starting to go off the deep end into anti vax. You should probably point out, like, at least to their credit, I think CMI and, and probably others did make a pro vaccine stance. Yeah. Made it public. Them. One, well, and I will also of... say, though, AIG has been wishy washy on vaccines, and Kent Hoven is explicitly anti vax. So yeah. it's, yeah, it's well, a mixed bag. To be it, sure, a lot of their base is um, quite anti vax or at least susceptible to it. Yeah. And or even even for people who are like the, they'll vaccinate the kids and and they went through it themselves. They, it's this this one they've got a problem with, and the others are fine. I get my measles shot and that's that's okay. But this one, no, and and it's become quite difficult to overcome. It, yeah, yeah. It's 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 very interesting the the attitudes that have been um, uh, doled out to different types of vaccines. Um, and and when you go back to the original anti-vax movement, it becomes very evident as to as to why these attitudes are the way that they are. The, the first guy who was anti-vax wasn't anti-vax; he was anti-MMR because he wanted to sell his own vaccines separately. Right. So it's like, okay, he was no one was ever anti-vax initially. No one was. Let's keep make that very clear. Um, Balthazar uh, two twenty eight for twenty dollars. Thank you very much, Balthazar. Balthazar says, after reading the Brian Deere book, The Doctor Who Fooled the World on Wakefield, yeah, Andrew Wakefield, that's who we were just talking oh, about. Oh, goodness. A survey on MMR. I'm even more horrified at anti-vaxxers. I thought there was a bad study. I didn't realize just how bad. Yeah, there's... It was, it was straight up fraud. Yeah, that, that history is very interesting, and that's precisely why discussing and uh, dissecting pseudoscience is, is so important. Yeah. Um, even if it seems silly and, and not necessarily... Yeah, it, it definitely came up, uh, if you recall this, Early on, the study, the study in California, where they were using serology to try and uh, estimate an infection fatality rates, and their statistics were just so far off that they wouldn't pass a high school course. Um, yeah. But you know, here they are, they dress up in the coats and they get on TV, and and I think most people just don't know how to evaluate those statements, and it's it's easy to have the confirmation bias, like especially in that situation, like, well, I, all I know is that the world sucks right now. I wanna go do this and that, and, and there's so many things I wanna do. So I want them to be right. And of course, everyone wanted them to be right. If they were right, then everyone would be happy. Like nobody would be disappointed, uh, but it wasn't even close to right. And it was quite deadly, the, the results from that. So many people convinced, but you know, not having the tools or not even knowing where to look and how to evaluate a statement like that, uh, can be, I, I mean, uh, best case scenario, a little embarrassing, but worst case scenario is quite deadly, right? Yeah, hey, real yeah. real talk, because one of the things that I do over on my channel are like, it, I basically teach a class in five minute segments, right? And I'm doing that with like Weather 101 right now. Um, and before that I did like climate dynamics. Um, 
I'm thinking about doing a statistics, statistics like. That cool. would be very helpful. Stats okay. to be hard yes, for please. Some folks to grasp. <laughs> okay. 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 Yeah, I can do. I can. Start, I can start thinking that through. Remember, um, there are three kinds of lies: lies, damn lies, and statistics. Yeah. 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 Statistics is uh, black magic. You're forgetting the fourth kind of lies: lies on paper. Uh, lines on paper. Yeah, there is that one. Yeah. So, so I think we've done. I think we've covered most. The only other thing yeah. that I can do with regard. Oh, go ahead, Jonathan. Uh, we haven't. Well, let's maybe not get into it, but we didn't even get into this whole. At, at the very beginning, the picture that you showed from the museum that they start with Rodinia. Oh, and yeah. All the continents <laughs> have to expand out, like break up, and then combine back into a supercontinent and then break up again. Underwater. Like, I, I know you mentioned that, but I just. 70 million years of plate tectonics. Like, I, I, I'm, I, like, I don't mean to be sound mocking here, but I cannot express just how asinine it is to think that first of all that the continents move that fast but i have to ask a question like how do we even know about these supercontinents both rodinia pangea and those aren't even the only ones they're just the two that they want to pick because they're i'm the gonna most pull popular. it up i'm gonna pull it up so everyone can be refreshed i mean, I, I, I want to be clear like the way we know about these supercontinents and that the past geographic position of the continents is from this complex sedimentary record and if we're wrong about how we interpret that record, especially the magnetic data, the radiometric dates that uh, uh, constrain the chronology, um, the basin analysis. I mean, it, it's not just like the mountain ranges that are forming that we see. It's also the seawater chemistry, which is re recorded in, in ancient shells and micrite and other things. It's also the basins that form adjacent to the origins. So for example, you go to like the Rocky Mountains today, what do you see? Uh, the rocks are weathering, they're eroding, they're coming down the hill and being washed down through like streams and rivers and in, into the floodplain, right? And all this is crumbling down. As you can imagine with ancient orogenies, that's exactly how it works too. And so let's go to like the late Cretaceous when you have the severe orogeny forming with uh, still, you can see that deformation day in like Northern Utah to Western Wyoming, um, going down toward like central Southeastern Nevada, like that's where the origin was, the mountain range was. Um, but we don't have that mountain range anymore there. It's, it's gone. But we do have the basins that accumulated next to the mountain range, right? So those rocks were uplifted, had to be solid because you can't weather and, and you know, crack into boulders and pebbles and such. You can't do that with soft sediments. So this had to be totally solid with fossils in it, all weathered down and rolled down the hill into braided streams, into floodplains, and then this transitions as you go to Eastern Utah into the shoreline deposits of that Cretaceous interior seaway. So like all this is recorded, and this is how we know about events like uh, continental collisions and subduction of island arcs to expand the continent that we now call America, you know, the Americas, for example. Uh, this is, it's very detailed and it totally contradicts everything about, especially Pangea forms underwater. Like, it, come on, like the, the only way we know about Pangea are sediments that obviously were not formed under Because Pan Pangea is characterized by its aridity, like the, the, especially the center of this. Yeah. Sediment. It's characterized by aridity that can't be stressed enough. This can be investigated by like, oh. if I'm wrong, you guys, but like isotopic ratios and and how the sediment itself is laid down. It's, and the paleosols and the paleosols, yeah. <laughs> oh, and the thing. Uh, one last thing, sorry, and then uh, sorry. say something. But it, this this kind of thing, I heard again from from one of the many online YouTube creationists that all of this heat problem that that we're observing is actually being put to work to move these continents. That's bonkers because the continents themselves, you know, shuffling around at race car speeds on the top of the mantle is itself generating more heat, right? Also, how are you connecting this accelerated nuclear decay heat into moving the continents around? None of it makes any sense. It's all very ad hoc and it's all completely spitting in the face of the corroborative data that we have for how the sediments for, for supercontinents like Pangea or Rodinia were actually formed. 
And if you accept the evidence for Pangaea and, and Rodinia, why not everything before that? I mean, because Rodinia is this Neoproterozoic supercontinent that's quite late in Earth history. There's a lot of tectonic history and, and accretion and uh, uh, supercontinents forming well before that. I think I know why. It's because they think that Rodinia is probably the first supercontinent that any of their target audience is likely to have heard of. Well, the, yeah, if you go to Wikipedia, it's the oldest you know, supercontinent, supercontinent that's like officially recorded. But if you know anything about, you know, tectonics and structural geology, like that's not where it begins. Well, and you'll get, you'll get folks like, um, I, I believe it's Woodmerep, but I'm not 100% sure. It, it may have been Baumgartner, one of the, the YEC um, geology guys who is like, okay, it's very clear that in the pre-flood world, the Canadian Shield, which is this very, very old rock that's in North America that, that isn't typically, you know, covered in this marine sediment, like as deep as some of these shallow sea areas, if that's correct, Jonathan. Um, so, so, the, so the question is, if this is the pre-flood world with only the Canadian Shield in North America being above water, why do we have all these ecosystems that are preserved intact in the rest of North America if the entire geologic column was deposited during the flood? Did these critters swim out in the middle of the flood to these areas and just so happen to make up uh, excellent representations of their of their native communities in the Canadian Shield, which was supposedly, according to Woodmrap, the only thing that was above water in the antediluvian world? It, none of it makes any sense. None of it corroborates with any of the other aspects of the model which is why the model doesn't stand. Um, if I may, earlier you mentioned how um, Pangaea was pretty much very arid. Um, and it's still only, what, 30% of Earth's uh, land mass, or rather, uh, surface, is that land. And yet it's so large that the interior cannot get water from the ocean because it just doesn't reach there. Probably the closest then, modern analog is that cent arid Central Asia. Yeah, that, that's why I'm thinking. We see today that Central Asia, because of areas like the Himalayas and the mountains of China, doesn't get much water. Now think of the, the entire Earth being 90% land and only 10% uh, water for surface area. Yeah, it must like, have been a very luscious uh, rainforest. <laughs> Right. And it's covered in rainforest, apparently. It's no desert. Because as as is usual, as Guys. is Guys. Sorry, Erica, go ahead. I was gonna go. No, go, go. I'm sorry. Guys, one of the things that sets desert regions is I'm gonna talk about the Hadley cell again. I've never talked about the Hadley cell yes. half as much. <laughs> like you get desert regions at plus or minus thirty-ish degrees lat, right? Because that's the descending leg of the Hadley cell. That that does not care about whether or not it is um, uh, like the arrangement of the continents. That just cares about the size of the earth and how fast it spins, mm. right? So if we're not, and if we're not changing that, then the whole thing isn't a rainforest team. <laughs> it, it, yeah. Okay, I'm done, I'm done. <laughs> It's 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 the classic eyeballing method that you see with with the younger creationists. For for those of you who are curious as to what I've spent my past three days doing, it's been deciphering the the kinds placard that I took a picture of when I was at the Ark Encounter in Williamsburg, Kentucky, or whatever. And what I realized is very similar to to what we're discussing here, which is that a lot of it is eyeballing, and a lot of it is like, well, you know, that kind of sounds like it could work. There's never any math. There's never any calculations. There's never any cohesive model that accounts for, for numerous different mechanisms acting in tandem, uh, because to do so would be to, to find something that's cohesive. So one mechanism that you can use to solve one problem is cohesive with another mechanism that's used to solve another problem, instead of these two things constantly clashing against one another, um, which seems to be like the meme with the young earth creationists. Um, it, it, solving one problem inevitably leads to issues with the solution, proposed solution to another. Um, a, a, another classic that they propose, and I mean, I guess before we move into this one, does anybody have anything else to say before we move into kind of the last solution to the heat problem? I, I mean, for decrypting that uh, plaque uh, that was um, 
really just complete nonsense because you could barely make it out without it glared uh, in their light setup. Um, you really do deserve a PhD in crypto analysis. <laughs> Place yeah. right up there with the people that broke the Enigma code. Well, I, I, I need a new. I, I, need, I need a new uh, pair of specs after it because my eyes have been strained so much by trying to improve it. I, I have some one thing to say. Snore, homely, tramp, frantic, damp, odd, white, amuck, meat, fold, scared, lackadaisical. I don't know what that is, Dapper. It's twelve random words from the English dictionary. Okay. I don't. I just figured it, I didn't really have anything to say, but I wanted to say something, so I figured random words might work. Okay, um, Dapper, I'm cool with that. Whatevs. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, before we move on, do we want to touch on that super chat you got that was asking for like? how do you reach like people you care about that are in this type of like science denialism and young earth creationism specifically? I, I was imagining that we would go through that after we kind of put a bow on the, the whole heat problem thing. Uh, if, if that's okay. totally fair. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. I just well, didn't want that to get forgotten. Kind of like wrap that up and, and you know, put it away. The, the only la the last thing that I know of that's used as the mitigation is, is it's a classic picture of Brian Nichols's hands around a blowtorch and this, this idea of directed heat. So it's like the heat is only going forward. So when the jets come up, they're not actually exchanging heat with the surrounding environment. But we kind of already discussed it. Jordan's nodding his head. He's pretty familiar with it. I've, so I've seen that. I, I've seen him do that. Um, so I guess what he's saying there, the, the point that I think they're trying to make is, well, I guess they're trying to counter the point where if you had this uh, jet coming up, it would heat up the whole atmosphere. And I, I think... What they're saying is no, it could be directed heat, so it wouldn't interact with the rest of the the area around it. I haven't done a lot of math on it. I'm skeptical that you could sustain such a jet for the length that you'd need to without any significant heat trans heat or matter transfer with the surroundings. Um, you you'd need a De La Bell nozzle again. I mean, in order to get that jet, it's this very specific formation in geology that we, you know, utilize it obviously in, in mechanics and human society. But in order to get that kind of jet to reach whatever the exosphere or whatever it is they're trying to reach to actually cool this superheated water before it supposedly falls down as, as rain, you need a very specific kind of nozzle and they've provided zero mass, zero mechanism to actually create said nozzle. And additionally, once it reaches up to this thin air, that, that heat exchange is still going to happen. Right. Like like you mentioned or like we discussed earlier, Jordan, it's like you're, you're getting up there. It can't go all the way into space because, again, it still has to fall back down. Right. So that heat exchange is still going to hurt, occur in the atmosphere. Superheating it, if you will. Yeah. Uh, I actually have one last thing specifically for Dapper uh, from my notes, which is that um, uh, according to some creationists, uh, large aquatic creatures were killed by the heat. Things like uh, megalodons or dinosaur like creatures aquatic. I mean, okay, but then how did you know the various whales survive? Because the thing is, you look at like baleen whales, right? Um, their ancestors, their common ancestor, probably wasn't exactly very tiny. For one thing, doing the you know filter feeding of things like krill is a pretty large body type niche. They're still around, so I, I mean, it it just doesn't work very well. Same thing with whale sharks, right? Now, whale sharks are a less extreme example here, but like. We have large oceanic creatures that that survived. So, explain that. Like, why is it that whales survive, but the smaller, say, mosasaurs don't? Um. As as a quick aside, just to you know, to do due diligence with the panel or with our panel and with our side chat, our friend Sunflower, who who has always been chill with the panel or has, with the channel rather, has asked the question to the panel. Hmm. Why could it not have just been a massive amount of ice to absorb all this heat? He says water has a high specific heat capacity of any highest specific heat capacity of any liquid. Um, the amount of one gram of something absorbed. He's basically just talking about the specific yeah. heat of water. Right. And then he discusses how it would take only 2.4 times 10 raised 24 kilograms of ice to absorb all that heat. I think that's a very, I, uh, very I high. Think that's, that's, I think yeah, that's, that's a pretty that's big incorrect. Uh, I think it's, I, I don't know if it's right. Um, the, the amount of, I don't know how big of a mass you'd need 
worth of ice in order to absorb all of it, but I feel fairly confident it'd be greater than the entire size of the Earth. Well, hold on. What was the number that we were given for the amount of ice? We're giving, for the amount of ice, Sunflower is proposing that we are dealing with 2.4 times 10 raised 24 kilograms of ice to absorb all that. Okay, well, that's already, like, two-thirds the mass of the Earth. So, so the the issue with that as well is if the ice is absorbing the heat, then it's melting. Right. right? So it should we should already have an extra two thirds of the mass of Earth in liquid water right now. We well, don't. Large, so, so those measurements, sunflower, those don't add up just volume wise. But additionally, if the water is coming from the fountains of the Great Deep, which is scripturally what's being proposed by the Young Earth creationists, then that water again isn't matching up a second time because you're getting what two thirds of the amount that's already sorry one third I'm, I meant to say one third my, my, my. but either way you're, you're increasing the proposed mass of the earth by a huge portion like spoiler warnings guys the mass of the earth is not taken up by one third water water takes up essentially none of the earth's mass like none of it it's almost all silicates and iron Water is a vanishingly small percentage of the mass of the Earth. And here we have proposed that there was a full third or so of the Earth's mass composed of ice during the pre-flood period. Well, and I'm not even going to question whether or not that's the right number that would absorb that much matter, that not much heat. Not only that dapper, but, but as, as a quick aside as well, if we're going to take the Young Earth Creation's position, then the pre-flood rock is all Precambrian. Right. So we're mm -hmm. looking at all Precambrian rock. The environmental conditions that we can glean from that rock, the, the general temperature of the earth, it's balmy. Like we're, yes. we're looking at something that's very, very warm and is not going to be conducive at all to the ice that Sunflower is proposing. So either Sunflower needs to propose that the young earth creationists either need to shift their model into being something that, that is drastically taking a different um, uh, sort of they're taking uh, credit for a different section of the geologic column, or we're not going to have that ice sheet with those given temperatures. Maybe pre-flood pre is actually like snowball earth time. We can push it all the way back to that. Yeah, we're going really far back. Ah. You know, just um, just doing some quick math here, uh, that number that is posted, the amount of ice it would take. Um, take the last glacial maximum ice sheet, either like the, the one that covered Eurasia, so it's like all of Scandinavia and big parts of Europe and Russia. Uh, take that and multiply it by about 1 million, a little bit more than a million, and yeah. that's what you're talking about. I mean, we're talking a pre-flood world that's basically just a ball of ice miles thick. Yeah, I mean, these, these ice sheets were enough to shift the sea level, the entire like global sea level by about 130 meters. So let's multiply that by about a half a million now, and I, I don't know. I mean, there's not that much water available and and yeah like it's like i said um, it's it's a third of the mass of the of the current mass of the earth and uh one caveat to that so so usually when we talk about the heat problem we're talking like kind of a global sort of thing but that's not the only facet you have to take into account you also have to take into account that there are living things supposedly on this earth that are supposed to survive this mm -hmm. whole accelerated decay right no, not so just, not just living things Jordan, we're talking about entire entire ecosystems right. of, of planktonic organisms, which are known to be the most sensitive with regard to things like acidity and temperature. So, for instance, uh, I think that we talked about this earlier, but like the potassium inside of, of you or Noah or whomever, the accelerated decay from that potassium by itself would be enough to boil Noah's blood. So no amount of ice under wherever it is is going to save Noah from the potassium in his own body. So uh, like it, it, you have to take it not just from the huge global level, but all the way down to the microscopic level within organisms. Yeah, this, this proposal fails on both ends, both the local level and the global level. And, and, you know, it, it misses, too, the, the, one of the larger issues with the global flood, which is that it left no trace of itself. I mean, th this is something that would be, like, the most evident geologic phenomena of all time. And well, that, that's a good point to make. And I, I want to say, too, since we're talking about heat and things that would happen all around the Earth, especially in the water, like, there are many proxies. I mean, heat has an impact on the chemistry of things, the chemistry of rocks, the isotopic chemistry of rocks. I mean, there are a number of proxies we can use to, I mean, if you, if you wanna say the, the 
past temperatures in the ocean, in the atmosphere, wherever, were this much. Like we can test that claim. So go ahead and uh, say what they are. We could test it with the evidence and, and that's it. But, you know, to my knowledge, there is no evidence that the oceans were, you know, much all that much warmer than today. Yeah. Uh, just if it's it's not a huge margin actually between like modern oceans and and even the Mesozoic and early Cambrian uh, well, warmer greenhouse times. It, it's something I've said before. If the flood were true, there wouldn't be a debate about it. It wouldn't be anything that anyone could possibly contest in any realistic way. It would be blindingly obvious. There wouldn't be this like, oh well, maybe we can explain it this way. Like no. A global flood would be, I mean, let, let's face it, what it would result in is a globally correlated deposit of various types of turbidites. We don't find that. Therefore, there was no global flood. Full stop. There is nothing else we need to say. We don't find the results of a global flood. Therefore, there wasn't one, according to science. Now, all this stuff with the heat problem, right? This is This is actually secondary. This is like taking the ridiculous nonsense that creationists put out there that is literally on the same level in terms of scientific plausibility as the flat earth and taking it seriously because it's kind of fun to do so. And because some creationists will then take seriously, you know, these mathematical counters to the models that they are already believe in, but there isn't a question as to whether or not there was a, a global flood that has already been settled like well over a hundred years ago. We don't see the expected evidence and we see contrary evidence like, during the supposed flood layers, we have things like, you know, Aeolian sandstone, subaerial tuff, evaporite deposits, uh, preserved things like uh, footprints and uh, ripple marks and raindrops, all of which are precluded by the idea of all this forming literally underwater in a flood. There was no flood of global proportions on Earth. It's not a question. So all of this that we're doing is sort of like arguing about how many uh, angels can dance on the head of a needle. Because... The flood fails at page one. It's like and we're already on like page physics. fifty. Yeah. To to answer our friend over here, uh, Baptist Joshua, who says every culture records it in discussion no. of the flood. One that that actually isn't true. There there are lots of flood myths and lots of different cultures, but there's also shape shifting gods and shape shifting deities in most cultures. Um, there are dragons in many cultures. There are other you know animal human hybrids in many cultures. Yep. It, it turns out that there's quite a bit of, of shared it's, cultural identity. It's also I, just flat wrong that all cultures have a global flood myth. They don't. But, I mean, people live by water, so of course they have flood stories. Many yeah, people I was just going to say, it's, it's almost like people tend to live near water that is sometimes unstable, right? Yep. And I mean, it, so water is, is an excellent paradoxical symbol in mythic literature, and it, it, it's, it makes for really good literature because... I mean, water is simultaneously a source of life, a source of chaos. And yeah. if it's stable, it's good and, and everything is good. You know, everything, everybody's happy and, and alive. And uh, if there's too little or too much of it or inconsistent amounts of it, then you can't live. I mean, it's, it's yeah. just undoes everything. So it's, it's, it's really wrong on both ends. One is, even if it were true that all cultures had a global flood myth, that would not actually provide sufficient evidence to conclude that there was a global flood. But two, not all cultures do. So even if it did, even if that would provide good evidence, it's simply not true that all cultures have a flood myth that can be interpreted as anything to do with a global flood occurring in at, at any point in that culture's history. Yeah. Arguably, even the uh, ancient Near Eastern cultures didn't have a global flood myth, from the Hebrews to the Sumerians. It, I mean, the, the Egyptians didn't, and if anybody was going to, it was going to be someone who gets inundated by the Nile every year. And, to the and I mean, the, documented. not only did the Egyptians not have a global flood myth, um, they also have their culture extend further into the past than the alleged date of the global flood. So they managed to survive all of this somehow without being in the dark, contrary to what the Bible says. And you can say, oh, well, I disagree with those datings. Well, okay, that's great. When you can actually get your, you know, education in Egyptology and contest the dating based on the calendars of the Egyptians, or when you can figure out how to, you know, debunk things like thermoluminescence, which, by the way, can only give you uh, false young ages, not false old ages, then you know, contest Egyptology. But until then, 
Yeah. Egyptian culture predates and continues through the flood. The only way you can legend. They survive a global flood and then never bother to talk about it. Um, the only way you can move Egypt just like on roller skates post flood is if you just ignore archaeology in its entirety, which creationism already does to a large extent. It's just, uh, it's just like I think that's worthy of its own screen. Though. Okay, it really that. is. Baptist Joshua says, not a global flood myth, it's a story, not a myth. Okay, so here's the thing, right? Myths are stories, and myths don't have to be false. A myth is a story that tells a culture something significant about its history, and it has some application for how you're supposed to interact with your society or other societies or nature today, right? Or the gods. So being a myth doesn't mean it's false. Being a story doesn't mean it's not a myth. And being true doesn't mean it's not a myth. Flood myths are myths specifically because they are supposed to be some kind of foundational tale about how the world came to be in its present state, whether or not they're true. Wasn't there one more model of heat rejection? I don't remember what it was. Uh, there was. I don't think we went super into the the expansion of space, but it basically came down to like, oh, well, God just miracled it away. I uh, I actually have I have. A, a thing. Um, yeah, according to some creationists, uh, plants grew really large pre-flood because lots of oxygen, certain sound frequencies, magnetism, that stuff, because reasons. Uh, and that that absorbed heat. Oh, it made all yeah. the coal and oil. <laughs> oh, the coal and oil one. I've, I've heard them mention that, but I haven't ever really dug into it. Yeah, well, the the things with the flood, the things with the coal and oil is really interesting. Like the whole concept of like coalification and how they're invoking these massive floating forests because what's of what's been seen in like the Mount St. Helens eruption of Spirit Lake and all of these you know floating mats of logs and and things of that nature. There is absolutely no indication that anything like that occurred. I mean, we we are well aware of the processes that lead to things like coal and. You know, we have an entire period of time dedicated to, to a lot of this coal formation being the Carboniferous period. Now, invoking enormous floating islands of logs that are being just struck by lightning over and over and over again might seem nice, but this is something that, again, would be very evident in the geologic column. That is not what we see. So... There's a quick thing from chat I want to address. Um, so Sunflower says, right now, the total mass of water on Earth is 1.4 times 10 to the 21st. Right. But that's three orders of magnitude less, right, than your proposed times 10 to the 24th. So an order of magnitude means you add a zero, right? It's it's easy to look at these motors of magnitude and say, oh, well, the numbers there are close, right? It's so close, man. 20 and 20 like it's right there. But no, the thing is, if I have... Let's say I have one times 10 to the first dollars, right? That means I have a dollar. If I have one times 10 to the second, I don't have $2 or $5. I've got 10 to the third. I've got a hundred. See, see what I mean? Like it, it's an exponential thing. That's why it's powers and not just a factor. One times 10 to the 24th is a huge amount more than one times 10 to the 21st. So obviously this is a multiverse problem. So if you just split it into a thousand Earth timelines, maybe you can take that volume with it. Are we getting it? Is this like the Loki theory of uh, I'm just of young Earth? Just grasping for straws here at this point. So Fair enough. I, uh, I, I did want to ask, sorry, since we have a geologist right here, uh, it, I'm pointing at his picture. My hands are going the wrong way. I know. Uh, <laughs> I've heard them talk about like the formation of coal and oil as a way to be a heat sink. But I have to be honest, I have, other than you compress bio, biological matter and it, boom, some magic happens and it becomes coal. I don't, I don't know very much about it. So why is that nonsense? I'm, I'm, I'm sure it is. I just don't know why. Well, the, the heat uptake in, in the pro like in the formation of petroleum products, like this is fairly low temperature with a long cook time, right? So you get temp there's like the sweet spot temperature for, for oils is, is somewhere around like 140 to 160 degrees centigrade. This is not that hot. And that's applied over several, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of years. 
that that's like the cook time at low temp. If you, I mean, you can cook it faster, and, and and I think they like to do this, you know, point out experiments where we reproduce hydrocarbons, and yeah, we can make synthetic hydrocarbons with high heat in a short time. Um, I mean, th because kinetically, if you add about ten degrees centigrade, you're like doubling the reaction rate. Uh, so to get from, you know, think about that, 160 degrees, the reaction rate is X, then 170 degrees, it's 10 X. And at 180 degrees, it's 100 X and so forth. So like you can increase the reaction rate, but you have to substantially increase the temperature. And when that happens, you get hydrocarbons, but you don't get what you find in the earth, like the same uh, chemical composition of that oil. I mean, they're, they're distinct from each other, just as, just like if you tried to, um, you know, roast a roast, like a whole pot roast, instead of putting it on for three hours, you put it on for 10 minutes in a crematorium, like you can do that, but you can obviously tell the difference between the two, even though they're gonna have, you know, so, sort of similar end compositions in the denatured proteins and stuff like that. Thanks for the explain it like I'm five, now I know. <laughs> I, I, well, yeah, I, mean, I hope that's understandable to the general audience, um, but especially the point about like the the kinetics of it, because I, I I think there's this misunderstanding. They're like, well, if it can if you can do it slowly, you can do it fast. You just got to change some variable, and like it's it's a bit more complicated than that. And I like to and use the cooking analogy because I think people can understand that just because you can. You know, if, if you if it says bake the pie for 30 minutes at this temperature, you don't just multiply the temperature by 10 and, and say, oh, I'll just bake it in no time at all. And then we can be on our way. Like cooking yeah, doesn't anyone, work like that. Neither does, you know, earth hydro like hydrocarbon. Yeah. It, by the way, guys, if you think that you can just turn up the heat to cook faster. No, please don't. Bad idea. So so. I think that covers most of our stuff. I'm gonna share my screen real fast and go over what we covered really quickly and then we can move to the last question and we'll close ourselves out that how do we combat the young earth creationism thing? Uh, and you guys feel free to add stuff as as I kind of go over our very brief list, just in case you I didn't get everything or I'm misrepresenting something because I'm a dumb dumb. So we got our problems and solution attempts here. So we discussed the one of the main problems with the radiation of food. So we've got thousand times lethal dose due to accelerated nuclear decay. That's a problem that's got to be solved if you're planning on fixing the heat and radiation problem. Then we've got the piezo, piezo piezoelectric effect, which is not going to work because it's stripping electrons. It's going to stop most of the decay, most of the decay and the energy for the some electrons. of the decay, not most. So okay, imagine it says some instead of most. Okay. Energy for the electric field would also result in plasma formation to some degree, which is going to be problematic. So your, your piezoelectric effect is not going to work. Your space is a heat sink. Reaching space is going to be difficult. It's going to require a Delaval nozzle, which also results in superheating the atmosphere when eventually that exchange does occur. Z-pinch is going to result in forming your more heavy elements, but without that accelerated decay, it's going to worsen the heat, or due to the accelerated decay, it's going to worsen the heat by orders of magnitude. Um, your hypercanes, they're getting risks of rid of less than 0.2% of the heat, assuming the earth is completely covered in hypercanes and assuming the rainfall is 50 times larger than your ICRs, hypercanes, the, the output that they're presenting. But it's also not possible anyways, because hurricanes are functions of size of the planet and they require pressure differentials. Also, your it's not rejecting heat into space. It's rejecting heat back in the atmosphere. So it wouldn't help. Okay. Also rejects heat into the atmosphere rather than space that doesn't work anyways orbital mechanics the ejecta is going to require several earth's worth of mass and also as dapper explained very eloquently that heat for actually ejecting it is going to be absolutely bonkers dapper do you want to repeat that number for us very briefly uh, so the number i got is 217 million but i'm just rounding it a bit over 200 million Hiroshima bomb level of heat per square meter per second over 140 days. 200 million Hiroshima's of heat per meter, you said? Per meter? Square meter. Per square meter, per square meter per second for the entire year of the flood, you said? Yeah, so I, I, I used 140 days because there's a little bit of, like, you yeah, know, debate, but... All right, so orbital mechanics, that's going to be highly problematic. 
Your space expansion was uh, never actually presented as a real solution that wasn't supernatural. So you can use the space expansion as you want, but it's a miracle, as as uh, dictated by the um, by the actual former of said hypotheses. The directed heat, the heat exchange in the atmosphere is still going to be lethal, and it has to occur in the atmosphere in order to fall back down as rain. And the coal is the heat sink. Well, obviously, coal forming super quickly like that is going to have diagnostic characteristics, as uh, Jonathan just mentioned. It's very clearly distinguishable from coal that forms over long periods of time, which is the type that we see everywhere. What do you guys think? Do you think that that's an appropriate summation of today's discussion? And do we want to add anything? Uh, big flex. Big flex. Okay. Well, in that case, I think that we've we've sufficiently covered a lot of the potential ideas for, for fixing the heat problem, as well as the main issues, uh, as well as talking about the fact that there really isn't going to be a heat problem in the first place, because there's no indication that accelerated nuclear decay has to occur. So if you are a creationist and you're thinking to yourself, I'm going to solve this heat problem, first you have to show unambiguously that there is or has been accelerated nuclear decay. Then you got to solve all of the heat and the radiation itself, while also explaining why your mitigation uh, efforts do indeed work. And that requires numbers, boys. So if you're doing a big, long stream on something like this and you're coming without numbers, at like zero numbers, unlike members of this panel who did show up with numbers, I'm really sorry, that's not going to cut it and your, your solution is going to continue to be irrelevant to the broader scientific community. May I make um, a friendly suggestion to the, the creationists out there? Please do. If you can get the equations, just check Wolfram Alpha. It will take care of a whole lot of the math for you. And as long as you input the equations correctly, there you go. So you don't even have to crunch the numbers yourself. You just have to get the correct starting numbers and the correct equations. It's really easy, guys. Not too tough. So to answer our, our final question, as Maddie uh, kind of mentioned earlier, how is it does that everyone in the panel would like to suggest to you, let me pull it back up, our pal over here, if I can get that far back. How is it would we suggest coping with having younger creationist family members? It, how how yeah. would you deal with that as, as individual panel members? Because I know there are members of the panel, unlike what someone in the chat just mentioned, our friend uh, Baptist Joshua says that we're atheists who mock the Bible. Uh, not everyone on the panel is an atheist. In fact, I, I don't know who on the panel is or is not. Um, I can speak for myself. I'm an agnostic, so I don't really have a strong feeling either way. Uh, but I think it's it's unkind and uncharitable to assume that because you know individuals on this panel don't buy into the non-scientific aspects of a particular interpretation of Genesis that they don't have a faith. I don't think that that's fair about this, Joshua. Uh, but Maddie, since you you were you were psyched about this question, so if you'd like to go first, by all means. Yeah, so no, I like this question a lot um, because, so I guess there's kind of two sides to it. So one is the like, do you want to try to change your family member's mind, right? And I think if you're going to, if you're going to do that, because if it's just a, how do we, how do we cope with that? It's like, oh boy, howdy, let's just not bring that up. You know what I mean? Like, let's just make a policy about topics. We don't talk about it at Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> but if we're going to try to like change people's mind, then I think one of the biggest things to recognize is that it's not going to happen in one conversation. It's not going to be like, oh, this is the one thing that absolutely changed my mind, right? Um, or their mind or whatever have you. Um, it's going to be a lot of conversations. And, and as if you're going to, we're going to catch a lot more flies with honey than, than vinegar, right? So if you can approach um, any, if you can put yourself in a position where you are a like, take any question that they have seriously, right? Um, try to not embarrass them, right? And try to re reply to those questions um, like with like both kindness and, you know, and honesty um that that's gonna go a long way one of my favorite conversations i ever had with a young earth creationist um oh it was my old chaplain at uh at my at my uh my old command um and he just had some questions about geology he was an older guy he was about to retire from the navy um and 
you know, think about, he, I don't, he was probably, he was, I thought he was like in his seventies. That seems like really old to still be on active duty. I don't know. He, he had like white hair. Um, and, you know, try to think about, I, I tried to think about like, Hey, what, what was the level of geology that made it into high school and middle school textbooks in the 1960s? Right. Uh, I, and, and so I think our, the end of our conversation was like, if you want to believe in young earth creationism, then you have to ignore a lot of really good science. And that was like, that was like my like tact level of thousand. But because of that, we had several more conversations and he trusted me to ask me with question, more questions because I didn't treat him like an idiot. And I, I you know what I mean? And I, I didn't make him embarrassed to not know things. So I think like, trying to remember what level of education and what the stat state of education was, you know, whenever this person last took a biology class, right? Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. I, I've been told I have like tact level a thousand. That's like my highest stat. I believe that, I believe that. <laughs> um, but that's, that's how I generally usually try to approach things. Mm. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? I I think that's a superb answer. I don't know what I would say. What I would there's, say. there's only one minor thing I want to say, which is um, it may be the case that your family member that you're trying to, to reach about this is not going to be amenable to changing their mind. Because um, one of the things you remember is sometimes when someone's belief bias is strong enough, um, facts and evidence that counter their current belief actually entrench them in their current in their current belief. And so you may want to consider whether or not um, it's worth the strain to your relationship. So I have uh, family members who are young earth creationists and with some of them, I know that they're, you know, uh, open enough to uh, changing their mind that sometimes I'll bring things like that up. Mm -hmm. I know that there are other ones who it's just not worth it. It's just going to upset them. It's going to never change their mind as far as I can tell. And so you, you want to choose your battles. Um, it, Cause the thing is, like I said, while there is a strong correlation between believing one kind of pseudoscience and believing others, young earth creationism is not on its own, a terribly dangerous thing, as long as you're not working in a field where it's important to, you know, get these things right, which most people aren't. So perhaps if they have other beliefs that are more dangerous, like anti-vax, or they think that like, like Ken Hoban says, eating cyanide is going to prevent cancer or cure it. Yet, yeah. focus on those specific things if if you if those are da more immediately dangerous ideas, because uh, sometimes it's just not going to happen. Like I have family members that I'm I'm pretty sure they're just going to be young Earth creationists to their grave, and you know what? It's not the worst thing. I think that's fair enough. I mean, I it, it, unless anybody else has anything to add, we've been going for two hours and 11 minutes. Go ahead, Jordan and Jonathan. Jordan. Just uh, <laughs> one quick thing. Um, yeah. Talking about the boundaries with keeping families, uh, Sean McDowell and genetically modified skeptic to the stream, talking about how to basically talk as mm -hmm. atheists and theists. That's really good if you're looking for that angle. If you're trying to convince them, I think a lot of people who are young earth creationists are not that way because of some kind of reasoned examination of the evidence. It's uh, partly because they're theologically motivated. Uh, the Bible has to be literally true. That's very fundamental to their faith. Um, and if you gave up that one thing, it's kind of like the, the dike that's holding everything back. And if you give that up, all the faith will collapse and they don't want to lose their faith. So they're not interested in anything else to say. If the person is like that, you could try to talk to them about how if you're faithful, that's not the case for you. You could point them to people like Francis Collins and other uh, science communicators who are Christian, who are not creationists, and Biologists. maybe, but yeah, that's another good one. Uh, but but try uh, if that's the kind of person you're talking to, then I would try to lovingly coach them through the fact that you can hold the two ideas, and, and it doesn't mean your entire worldview needs to collapse. And yeah. if um, if you can do that lovingly. Uh, then they, that might help them become more open to change in their mind. Actually, if, if I add uh, on real quick to that, um, I do an occasional show called Leading Our Earth Creationism, which Jordan is actually going to be on here uh, next month, right? Yep. So a number of the people that I've interviewed ha did, in fact, then leave religion, but a number of them also didn't. 
I've got a mix of people on that show. Some of them stayed religious, some of them changed their religion, some of them left religion altogether. It is not a believe in God or believe in evolution. A lot of young earth creationist ministries want to pretend it is that way because it helps keep more Christians giving them money because they think it's a matter of, well, it's either this or, you know, nihilistic atheism, but it, that, that's not at all the case. It's really important to note to Dapper's point there that the the polling right now, at least in the United States, and, and it's certainly more so in, in Europe, like certainly more so, but the vast majority of Christians in the United States are are fully accepting of science. I, I believe the last number was 18% were young earth creationists, as in humans created in present form 6,000 years ago, approximately. Um, and and the rest believed in either, you know, classic conventional science and evolutionary theory or God guided, both of which, in my opinion, are fine. I, I have no no qualms with, with theistic evolution. And, and you know, I that's just my Same. opinion. That being said, you know, we also have to appreciate that because of that number, the majority of the United States are Christian. The majority of the Christians accept conventional science. And that means a lot of our scientists are also Christian. So yep. these, these faith and science do not have to clash. That is not something that is, is necessary. Um, and, and the vast majority of individuals have a faith and they're, they're, you know, can accept conventional science and they do amazing work. And that's awesome. Uh, I, I fully reject what our, our pal Otangelo is saying in the chat right now, which is that young earth creationist leads to old earth creationist, leads to theistic evolution, leads to atheism. That's just fear mongering, my friend. I mean, and, and it completely yeah. slips in the face of the statistics that we see. So I don't see an issue, you know? Yeah, it's demonstrably false, um, especially if you read the works of people all along that spectrum and, and examine their lives and interview them, and et cetera. I, I would say, like, if, if you're interested in communicating with somebody who's caught up in this, one resource, unexpected resource I'd suggest is Catherine Hayhoe. And, and I, she's a climate scientist and all of her work is on uh, communicating about climate science. So this is a totally different topic, but she does it extremely well in trying to identify like just how people are persuaded. And I, and I, I do like to highlight or emphasize that there's a difference between proof and persuasion. What we've been doing here and in, in, in regards to like a, a conventional disproving a hypothesis, you know, falsifying a hypothesis. That's what we're doing here. But the average person, the average American especially, is not persuaded in the same way as like a peer review panel at Nature or Science. Like, and often we forget that, that like just, just going through uh, the scientific aspects, going through the mathematics and, and so forth is not going to be persuasive to a lot of people and often it will just entrench them further. The key like to communicating this is first to find what values you have, what values you share and you build from that point, right? Uh, and, and that's why it is, it probably would be helpful to go to a resource like, I mean, if they're confused about evolution, you know, go to a resource like Francis Collins or Ken Miller before you go to a resource like Richard Dawkins, you know, somebody who's openly antagonistic toward faith, because then they see it like, well, if I read too much about this, I'm going to end up like that. I'm going to have to leave more than just that. It's not just an intellectual switch. Like I'm going to have to leave my community and, and it's, it's a uh, misleading. So I, I would go first toward those resources. Um, I, I did have an, Oh, there, Ken Ham wrote a book. Um, I can't remember, like a decade ago, at least called Already Compromised. And he went around and like the, the goal of this book was to go through Christian colleges and interview what professors believed, both in their Bible department and in their science departments. And these are Christian colleges as defined by Ken Ham. So it's it's mm. pretty, uh, yeah, that's that's their, what they would define as like a, a pretty legit Bible college. And, and they found that within there, like the vast majority of professors did accept the age of the earth. They accepted the evolution diversification of life over this time scale, um, you know, and they had kind of mixed views about human evolution, origin of life and, and things like this. But still, the vast majority in these conservative, what Ken Ham would accept as Christian colleges, uh, held to that view. And, and he saw it as like, oh, this is horrible. Like they're, yeah. they're just compromising, they're going the way. But one thing I can't stress enough, is that all of this, you know, all of this talk about 
you know, how we even get into this position of trying to defend a young Earth timeline, uh, the, the heat problems and so forth, it all results from an absurdly reductionistic reading of the Bible itself, which would not, I mean, the, an interpretation that would not even be defensible in a high school literature class. It grows out of that. And I think what is, is probably the most, um, best way to facilitate, I think, that transition sometimes for some people would be to just study ancient literature, study literary criticism, literary analysis, and things like that. Not, not criticism is like, we got to break this down, but criticism as in like, how do I understand what the text means and why it says this and, and how it all connects with each other. Like sometimes that can be the most helpful step for people in that situation. It's not just going straight to the science. I think that's the truth. And, and you know, I've, I've spoken with some others who take that, same, that similar opinion in Joshua Bowen here on, on YouTube, Digital Hammurabi, who takes that stance as well. I mean, he thinks that when you're discussing with young earth creationists, it's it's kind of futile to discuss science because as we've seen in from some members of our side chat just this evening, you can always just say, who are you to question God? If he says the earth is young and you want to interpret it that way, then that's just how it is. And whatever science says must be wrong simply by by your um, by by your kind of ideology. So I think you're right. I think if you want to take a look at the scripture or like the, the uh, ancient Near Eastern interpretations of some of these scriptures, which are, by the way, the most uh, exegetically, I believe it's exegetically sound, uh, because they're what the individual authors who wrote the texts in the first place were, they're the cultures that they were living in. I mean, you interpreting the language itself isn't good enough. You also have to interpret the culture. Otherwise, you're not getting the full picture. Be like if someone, you know, 50 years from now looked back, 50, 50,000 years from now looked back on our culture and they were like, yeah, you know, they, they'd they write stuff like it's raining cats and dogs outside. You know, they really thought that it was raining cats and dogs. Isn't that crazy? Wow. What a bunch of morons. It's like, no, we didn't. It's a it's a figure of speech. It's like you, you have to understand the culture to understand what the people who were writing were saying. Uh, and that's what most of these folks, the, the biblical scholars, by the way, very few of which are, are young earth creationists or even think that the Hebrews understood it to be a young earth creationist interpretation. Um, they, they use these, these exegetical using the scripture to interpret the scripture means to reach the cultural conclusions that they do, which is not a young earth creationist one, again, by the way. Um, so with that, we've been going for almost two and a half hours. I, I had an absolute ball. I think I think we covered a lot of information. I'm going to be putting the series of challenges that, that we wrote down in the PowerPoint in the description so it can be easily accessible to others. I will also add a few others based off of what we've discussed here in the side chat um, with regard to sunflowers challenges with using massive amounts of ice as well as some others. Does anybody want to add anything before we kind of head out here? I had a ball and I can't thank you guys enough for being here. You're welcome. I do have one thing. I would say, I would recommend to anyone watching now or in the future, put in the comments how likely you think it is that we're going to get a response to this that actually involves math that doesn't break physics, that also solves the problems involved. Uh, can I make a prediction? <laughs> sure. Zero percent. Well, I mean, put put in the comments what you think your prediction is and why it's zero percent. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I I think a good challenge to go with that is if you object to anything here, make your objection in the form of a hypothesis and tell everyone how it can be tested. Ooh, I like that. Ooh. Yeah, like it, love it. So we can actually do so. Yeah, because Crazy, man. Yeah, there are panel members here who are who are capable of, of helping us to test at least some of your hypotheses. If and remember, oh, sorry. Remember, when nope. we say test it, you have to give falsification criteria. You have to say, if I'm right, we'll find this. But if I'm wrong and we find this, then that's it. I'm done with this exact hypothesis. You can modify it afterwards. That's fine. But you still have to give falsification criteria. Otherwise, it's just a just so story that we can't test. Yes, I think I think that's true. I think our, our sunflower says I used math that didn't break physics off the top. That's true, sunflower. But your problem with your massive amounts of ice again is that it, it has to leave like a diagnosable trace of itself. If we're dealing with a snowball Earth during the time of the flood, 
uh, in order to get rid of all that heat. One, it doesn't touch the radiation, but also we should be able to see a trace of a second snowball Earth, you know, sometime in between the Cambrian and the Cretaceous. That, that w resulted in Earth that's 33% heavier than it is now. That's another thing. Yeah, Dapper's correct. That's a that's another really good one to, to add to the mix is that, that that is going to increase the weight. If you're going to use all that ice to mitigate the heat, we're going to be adding a third of, of the weight to the Earth, which is going to be kind of interesting. Um, okay. All right, guys. With that, I think we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and sign off. I'm gonna hit the end broadcast. So please, everyone, do stay very safe out there and um, lo lots of love. L LOL. Lots of love. Have a good night and get vaccinated. Yeah, perfect. <laughs>